Talhurst End podcast. Read the blog on thetalhurstend.com. So delighted to be joined by former Reading midfielder Jem Carrot. And Jem, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to the End podcast. First of all, how are you? Yes, I'm, uh, I'm very well, thank you. Um, thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show. How are things career-wise? Obviously, you left Reading in the summer of 2015, joined Kaladastarai, signing that three-year deal. How are things in Turkey for you at the moment? How are things going at the club? Uh, and, and what sort of your short-term prospects at the moment? Yeah, like I said, obviously, I joined... Um... Well, nearly was it coming up to eighteen months ago, um, which was you know um, an extremely tough decision. You know, I love Reading to bits, and um, you know after after being there so long and you know being captain, it, it was the hardest decision I've made and, and probably will ever had to make. But at the, at the time, I'd obviously only played um, a few games after coming off that horrific and uh never ending injury. So there's still quite a little bit of doubt in my own mind. And um when I got off with the three year deal it was um I think I guess probably looking a bit more into, you know, securing for my own future and my family's just trying to think of you never know what could happen in football. Yeah. And and at the time the Red Reading were absolutely brilliant with me and, you know, I never have a bad word to say and I can completely understand where they were coming from in terms that I hadn't played a lot of football but there wasn't you know, a long, a long contract on offer, and I think most people in that situation would have probably looked at, you know, the security of a, of a longer term deal and at a club that I kind of always dreamed of playing for. You know, my dad supported Galatasaray, which was well, the whole family did, and you know, I'd I'd watched them a lot growing up and been to the stadium here on, on visits with my dad, and it was kind of like, you know. After such a long injury out, it was um, it was like, where's this come from? Kind of things. I'm sure a few people were like, <laughs> you know, it was just one of them things that were just too good to turn down. And you know, it was it was difficult. And it and it's still, I still sit here now sometimes thinking, you know, what happened if I stayed? And you know, it's one of them things. I guess will, will stick with me, and I'll have to live with. But that's how it is. And at the moment, um, you know, I signed, and it was a the manager, you know, brought me in, and I played a, a couple of games, done well, and. You know, I had, had a good chat with him about, you know, starting to, you know, settle in a bit more and, and get playing. And then he, he got sacked, um, <laughs> which was... Um, Not which ideal. Got, exactly, yeah. And, I, you know, they, they had a lot of faith in me coming over and, you know, proving that, you know, I could go there and do well. And I also had a lot of faith in the manager that brought me in, who I'd known since I was, you know, under 17s. And he came to watch uh, Red in Everton in the Youth Cup. Um, when we were like 17 wow. he was the original turkey scout that scouted me for the for the youth team so he kind of always followed my career and you know that meant a lot for me you know just to show that someone who'd followed me throughout my career was then you know willing to you know show that faith and, and bring me to you know now one of the biggest clubs in Europe so um, for him to get sacked was kind of a, a tough blow to take and the new manager came in and didn't you know obviously wasn't his cup of tea and I managed to play, you know, that Champions League game, which was obviously another another dream come true. And then I went out alone um, <laughs> to Bursa Sport, where the manager that had got sacked had gone to. Yeah. So again, with some faith, and you know, it was um, I'd gone there, you know, played a few games, done well, and 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 I enjoyed my time there. But came back to Galatasaray in the summer, and you know, it's it's been a uh, it's been tough. I've not been involved, and. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens coming up to January. But all in all, it's been a it's been a hell of an experience for myself and and for my family. And uh, it's uh, it's one you have to take the positives from. Absolutely. I mean, it's as you say, it's it's a dream come true sort of move. I think I remember we were sort of writing articles and things at the time on the Tyler Stand. And I don't think there's a single Reading fan out there that faced with your decision wouldn't have taken it. You know, a three year deal, chance of Champions League football, playing in a top division, one of the biggest clubs in Europe. I think it was a no brainer, really. But let's go. Yeah. Let's go back to the start of yeah. the time. Um, and how how did you end up in Reading to begin with? Because I'm right in saying you're a, you're an East London boy, um, South East London. Sorry, South my apologies. East I've London, now yeah. I've now upset a lot of the audience, so I apologise. Yeah. Um, around the sort of Millwall area, how did you end up in Reading's academy from there? Well, I was uh, I was at Wimbledon um, from when I was about six or seven till fourteen when they made the move to Milton Keynes, um, and it was just uh, it was. I couldn't ask that of my mum, really, driving up to Milton Keynes <laughs> and, uh, and back. And, you know, she's done absolutely everything for me. And, and she was like, it's whatever you want to do. But 
you know, I think it was a bit much. It was a bit much, and it would have ended up me moving out. It, it wasn't right, and uh, that's where obviously I, I used to watch Joby and, and Ledge, and um, you know I used to look up to them as kids. So that the chance to play with them, funny enough, when it came to Reading, I still still idolised them when they came at Reading. Really, so it was quite funny that um, <laughs> end up being a captain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, then after that, I was um, funny enough. I, I, I was on trial at Man, Man United. Um, somehow um and uh we played red in a, in a game and, and steve shorey and nicky hammond come up to me after and, and basically offered me a you know a scholarship and um i took it you know it was the best decision i've ever made really so that's how that's how i ended up there yeah who was in charge of the academy when you first joined was that when brendan was still there or was it nick hammond or, or was it when Eamon had taken over literally as Eamon had come in well, actually, before before I actually agreed, so I actually came on trial with Reading before I went on trial to United, and I had an absolute torrid in the trial game. Oh no! Uh, <laughs> against West Ham, where I think it was like uh, I think Jack Collison or, or who else was it in the, a, a game? The absolute run around, and I remember Naz Bashir after the game was like, "Oh, we'll get back to you." <laughs> <laughs> Don't call us; we'll call you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which was gutting. And I remember pesting Mum, going, "What have they said? What have they oh, said?" No. And, and it was like, oh, uh, nothing yet, Jem. So uh, that kind of went. Um, and then when I played uh, played United, played for United at centre back, and um, I had a, had a decent game, and and they offered it, offered it to me after. And yeah, it was as Eamon come in. So he, as I walked through the door, it was uh, it was Eamon that first greeted me. So you know, just just even speaking about him is, you know, it's tough. Yeah, it's uh, uh, just a really, I mean, tough year. Um, yeah. the, the stand, you know, I, I sit in the stand every day and you get to see his name proudly on, on what was the North stand and you see his face outside. Um, such a massive influence on the academy. I mean, you only had to see the tributes that poured in um, after he passed away to, to know how much he meant. I mean, how how was he with you? What was your sort of relationship like with him? Um, you'll get me choked up soon. Um, he was... He was a father figure, really. He was, uh, you know, we had so many, so many, um, you know, just there was so much going on when you when you're a kid. You're moving home, you know, you miss your family, and and Eamon was just brilliant. He was that, um, is that father figure that you you could speak to, and you would never want to get on his wrong side. And you know, he he'd always have a laugh with you, and he'd show you the right way, but. You know, there was always that thing where it was like your dad, you never want to get told off by him. And when you did, you, you felt it was the end of the world. And, you know, you're always, um, you're always thinking, uh, oh, no, like, Eamon. <laughs> and he knew absolutely everything, what you were doing at home, when you went back to your mum's, what you were doing. Uh, summer, he, had, he had spies everywhere. <laughs> and it would always crack me up. Even when I moved to Turkey, he, he was always sending me stuff and, you know, he, he's, he was, you know, the most influential person in my career and, and he always will be. And I've still got the texts, you know, that he used to send me on my phone just to keep, um, just to go over them every now and again. And, you know, he'll be massively missed. And I saw him just before he sadly passed and it, it was tough, but it was, um, it, it was, it was just nice to see him again after not seeing him for, since I'd moved to Istanbul and, you know, just, um, you know, we went out, We had a couple of chats about old, old memories and stuff, and it was um, it was tough, but it was something that I'll always look back on with good memories. The fantastic thing uh, about the work he's done is, is how, like you say, how many people he touched, how many people he had an influence on, and thankfully, you know, his legacy will live on for, for generations of Reading players. You know, you talk about people, you know, you yourself being inspired by him, someone's then inspired by, say, yourself or another academy graduate, and that goes on. And the fantastic work the academy's doing. I mean, you came through what is increasingly looking like a golden generation. I mean, you look at the players now that came through in that sort of four or five year spell. You've got yourself, you've got Alex McCarthy, you've got Ben Hamer, Alex Pierce, Simon Church, Hal Robson Canoe, James Henry, uh, and others that I'm, that I'm probably missing out, even players that didn't maybe quite make it, people like your Scott Davis is out there. Yeah. What what made that what made that group special? Was that just a lightning in a bottle or was it something you guys were doing? I remember the first day we were there and, and obviously we'd all kind of played together from what were we under fifteens and, and and we'd done really well that year and and we, we all were like like we were playing your Arsenals and, and your everyone and and we were we were giving them a good going over and and, and it was it was funny because we kind of knew that we were 
you know, a good bunch of lads, but you never kind of think past your your age group. And our first day at Hogwood, Eamon sat us up on the, um, on the little bank at, um, at Hogwood, all like the new group. So it's like me, James Henry, Piercy, Gilfie, Churchy, you had Tom Petrowski, who unfortunately he would have he would have probably been one of the best strikers Redden had seen, I reckon. But he had a horrific injury, and he kind of gets missed off that group. But he was, mm. he, it's a shame he never made it because he he was brilliant. And um, yeah, there were there he sat us down and and he and he pointed over to the second year scholars, your Scott Davies and, and your Liam Marums and and people like that and. He kind of just he made it a challenge. He made it a war between the first years and the <laughs> second years, and and I'll always remember that. And he made every day a, a battle. He made everything you did like a you know a, a game, and it was like you you have to win that game if you want to make it as a footballer. You have to beat them in front of you over there because they're the ones in, in your way at the moment. And it kind of just everything we did. The running he used to run us into the ground, but just used to make sure that we we knew that we'd had to beat that group ahead of us. And it was, it, it just installed something in us, I guess, that we never wanted to lose. We'd never want to give someone that extra yard, that little, that, you know, that little boost for someone else so that you're hurt. We'd do bleep tests and he'd say, if you don't get level 15, you won't make it. And we'd just be dying, like we'd just be <laughs> giving everything we had because we knew what he said was gold, and and he was like I said that father figure. So we everything he spoke, we just we listened to every last word, and we kind of just soaked it all up, and and we just pushed everyone else on. We we were probably the busiest group of kids you, you'd ever know. I look back at some of the stuff I did, and Piercy always brings me out of it, and I was like, wow, did I really? <laughs> used to do it? He just installed that kind of um, you know that, that sort of drive. That, yeah, just. So many words you can say, but yeah, we just didn't. We just wanted to make it so much, and we had a really good like group of bunch. We all loved each other, and you know, we all stay in touch now. And and it was um it was amazing to kind of come through as a group as as we did because it doesn't happen anymore. And well, apart from Reading, because it still is happening at Reading, it doesn't happen anywhere else. And I don't think Reading really does get the attention or, or the credit it does deserve for for that. So no, it was um. It was amazing coming through that bunch of lads and, you know, seeing Gilfie play in the Premier League and do so well now and just the stuff he's been doing since he was 15. And it, you, I was going to say, did you know he was that special from, from that early on? At what point did you go, this guy's, this guy's good? We had a, a game against Milton Keynes, Dons. I remember when we were 15 and, and they came in the change room. It was two lads, Gilfie and his mate, and we were all like, oh, who's this trialist now? And, and straight away we were like, we can't let the trialist be better than us. Let's put the trialist off. As, as all lads do, as the trialist comes in, it's kind of they're like the new one. It's your yard, to, isn't it? You know. Yeah, like they're trying to take your place kind of thing. You're looking out for your mates. And he got the ball 25 yards out. He come on a sub and he put one in the top corner. And we kind of looked at each other. We were like, oh, no. <laughs> We've got one on our hands here. And, and, and it, that was the start of it. And from that moment, I think we, we all knew. And, and then fortunately enough, Redding, Redding got, got him signed and sealed and we'd see it day in, day out, how how good he is. And yeah, I'll always say I'm the one that helped him make it because I always used to do his running in the academy, but uh, <laughs> he's an unbelievable player and, and obviously he's been a shining light for Swansea this year, but straight away he showed us how good he was. Yourself and Gilfie and lots of others, the one thing that sort of bound you together almost was that you all were out on loan quite often. I mean, yourself, you were at Bournemouth, and at Millwall, I mean, how important do you think those loan spells were for you? Because there's a lot of debate now whether players should stay in the academy system or go out and get football. I mean, what what do you think personally? Did you benefit from going out on those spells? Yeah, I, I think anyone that you'd ask ask in, in football who's probably been on loan will, will say going on loan is is huge. It puts you into that kind of man's world where you're going from. Not that we were baby by him because we, we were anything, but you see it now. I think there's like cleaning boots and, and all them jobs. We had it easy even then when you listen to people talk about, you know, painting the terraces and stuff. So you have to get out and, and play them games, you know, lose away to Tranmere on, on a wet and windy day and, and get abused for it by the gaffer. And it shows you what it really is like and, and how much you do want to kind of be in that world. And we all went on loan. I, I remember Piercy and, and James going on loan really young. I think it was to Norwich and, and Nottingham Forest. And, and all the other boys that are in that group who, who didn't manage to get loans were gutted because we thought, oh, like, obviously, if you're going on loan, like, you're, 
you're kind of like the ones that they want sooner and uh, and things like that. So, you know, fortunately enough, we we all got good loan moves and and we all benefited um, uh, uh, really well. I think Gilfie went to Crew. Yeah, he we, did. I remember. I think it was the third or fourth game in. Um, the Crew manager said this guy's special and the best player in this league. And I think he was only like 18. So, yeah, it it was pretty early on that people started to realise kind of Gilfie was was very good and, and Piercy went out and done great and Steve Coppel then obviously gave everyone a chance which was I think massive and, and probably forgotten about that it was Steve that kind of actually threw us in there at the deep end and, and put us you know out there to to try and earn our living. Yeah what was it like playing for Mill obviously you grew up it's roughly around the area what was it like playing in front of that sort of crowd and at that football club? Yeah, obviously when you're growing up, you, you hear all the stories of Millwall and, and my uncle was a, a massive Millwall fan. So when um, after my loan at Bournemouth, Gibbo rang me up and, and said that Kenny Jacket wanted to take me there on loan. And uh, yeah, I, I loved it because I was obviously moving back home as well. So it was it was perfect for me. But I remember my first game and I got absolutely abused <laughs> by, uh, by a Millwall fan. Won't go into too much details, but I think it was about me being Turkish. Oh, or something. And I was like, hold on a minute, mate. I'm... I've got a Mill shirt on here, but it was kind of, it, I laughed at it as well at the same time. So I was like, wow, football's crazy. But it was amazing, that little spell I had. I think it was, we played seven games. We, we only lost one and we kind of steered away from relegation. So it, it was a massive learning curve growing up. And it was something that made me really, like when you look back at them loan spells, I think anyone that, you know, is looking to go on loan, I think it's massive when you're a kid, you know, this don't get me wrong, the, the standards probably improved with the under-23 league and stuff, but you're getting players that are kind of like 21, 22 and, and haven't really got near to the first team now that, you know, if they don't make that, people, uh, other managers do look into how many games you've played and, and what standard you've played at. And, you know, it's massive now, I reckon, for, for young lads. So any advice I'd, I ever gave or did was to all young lads, or get out on loan, get yourselves out on loan if you can, no matter what level it is. And, you know, go out and prove it. I think Liam Kelly's shown that. He was at... Was at oh, I think, yeah. And I think that, that shows whatever level you go out to, you do well enough. And, and Liam's a great little player. And, you know, he's shown that and, and he's earned his chance this year and he's doing great. And, and it, it's brilliant to see that. So, it, like Liam now, he, he's, a you know, someone to look at for all the other young lads that, that are his age at Reading and, and other clubs to, you know, go, wow, just getting out alone and showing that you can do well is, is huge. Absolutely. Well, you came back to the club and as you mentioned, Steve Koppel brought you into the team. It was just after we'd been relegated back to the championship. And I remember you, had, you were in the team quite a lot early in the early part of the season. The team was flying and we were looking yeah. really well set to go you know, straight back up. And then something just something just stopped. I mean, we couldn't win a game at home. We were struggling. Yeah. What, what ha you were in the dressing room at the time. What happened to that team to suddenly go from being non-stop putting fives and sixes past the likes of Sheffield Wednesday to not being able to beat Barnsley. Well, he took me out of the team. That was oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, I remember the first couple of games, you know, I wanted to be playing and, and I didn't get the nod. And then um, I think it was Crystal Palace at home was my first game. We won 4-2 and, and I set up a goal and I was like, wow, like what a feeling. Like my first game at Reading, it, you know, the best feeling ever. It was, it was unbelievable. And like you said, we were on, we were on a wicked run and then, you know, I, I'm trying to think, but I think we just we just stopped taking our chances, and then that kind of that seed of doubt kind of came in, and I think we just changed a couple of ways we were doing things. We we always had this, you know, the little uh, like looking at five games and and how many points we would kind of we'd need or what we'd uh, what we'd target. Say is out of 15 points, we're like right, we've got these fixtures coming, we'll, we'll win there, we'll draw you you set a little points tally. And I think we kind of stopped doing that when it got a bit rough. And then we just couldn't score. And, you know, it was it was very poor. Yeah, we, we threw it away. And then it was the burn. That was the Burnley playoff, wasn't it? It was, yeah. And yeah, I think it was, was it Beaky's, not Beaky. <laughs> I was I was going to ask you, what yeah. uh, what did Steve <laughs> say to, if you can tell us, what did Steve say to, to Beaky in the dressing room after that red card? I'd say it was, uh, <laughs> I don't even think it was Steve. I think it was your Wallies and, and you and your Kevin Dillons that went absolutely nuts at him. <laughs> but all the other lads were a bit, we were just shocked, I think. We were all a bit a bit baffled by it and what kind of went down because it's the last thing you think about. I guess, when, well, I've only been sent off one, but I never thought about taking my shirt off or, or going mental at anyone. But no, it, it wasn't a good feeling. And 
I think just taking that first game into the second leg where I remember Churchy made his debut. Did, and yeah. So we were all buzzing for him for that. But we were, it was just gutting to kind of seeing it thrown away, especially when you looked at that strike force as well. Like, like if, if you had that now, you, you'd shoot straight back up, wouldn't you? Like, it was, it was just sad, really, that we couldn't, couldn't. And it was the end of that era, I guess, as well. I think a lot of people left after us not going straight back up. And it was, it was like the start of a new, a new begin. Well, that team, obviously, sadly, players departed, and then the start of a new beginning as well with, with us lot coming through. Was there anyone in that sort of team? Because you came up around that golden sort of 2005 6 uh, yeah. era. And season. Was there anybody in that squad that you particularly that took, you, it took you under their wing or you particularly looked up to? Yeah, and I, I, well, when you've got, you know, Sidwell and, and Harps, you know, were, you'd look at them and, and they would make sure we watched them and saw what they were doing. And from Harps, it was just that he ran all day. Like the guy was a fitness guru. He, he'd run around in training before training, doing laps with like weights around his ankles. And I was like, wow, like <laughs> this guy's nuts. Like, and then you could see, then you could see how. You know, in the game, how you know you'd always see the last fifteen, twenty minutes, how he'd kind of become, come into his own, and you know, feed off seeing players tired, and that was like amazing to kind of see how how he kind of how he used his training to go in, and he was always the first in the training harps. He he had breakfast club with uh, Nigel Gibbs that me and Pierce were a part of, and we do passing off the bounce boards and and loads of little technical drills to try and improve and. You know, I, I loved Harps. I still love Harps. And when I bought my first house in Reading in, in Shinfield, I, I lived on the same road as him. So it was like a, he was like my idol probably at Reading to move in, obviously, to on the same street as him. He's like, wow, I'm really making it here. So it was, um, you know, he, he was probably the top one. But obviously, Siddy was, was an unbelievable player as well who went on to great things. Oh, and, he's, and the fact he's still going, that goal he scored the other week, not, uh, yeah. not bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, Unbelievable, wasn't it? The left, the left <laughs> Um Yeah, he, he's a he's a quality player. To be fair, and you know, Harps is obviously. I think he's down with Bobby at Hungerford at the moment um, as well. So, so it's. Uh, I always stay in touch with Bobby to see how they're going. But yeah, City's is, is brilliant, and and I think Brighton the second now, and he, yeah. he's playing week in week out. I think he's keeping Ollie out of the team, so it just speaks volumes of you know, what a professional is and what a player. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned lots of players moved on after that playoff failure um, and Steve himself obviously left. In came Brendan Rodgers. It's one of those sort of really quite controversial eras in Reading. It was only six months, but it's one that you, you talk, get a group of Reading fans in the pub together now, you'll still get five different opinions on it. Yeah. You, you lived through it. What did Brendan, what was Brendan like to work with and why do you think it went wrong for him? I guess it's quite funny at the moment, obviously, with, with Yap Stam coming in and, and Reading are playing that total football at the moment, aren't they? And, and obviously doing brilliant with it. So I guess you can kind of try and compare them a little bit. But, you know, he came in and he, he changed a lot of things. And, and Brendan, he'd obviously come from Chelsea and he had that kind of uh, Mourinho-esque yeah. thing. But don't, his training was unbelievable. The boys absolutely loved it, and we were, we were like going into that start of the season. It was the, the home game at Forest, and we were like thinking we're gonna be, we're gonna batter these. Like we've been unbelievable in training. We we've been you know just we all felt on top of the world, and then I think we drew and we yeah, kept no, the. No, was it? Yeah, it was like a ball draw, but we kind of bossed the game without you know we kept the ball all day, and it felt great, but we obviously didn't win, and then. We kind of went on losing to Newcastle, then uh, I think it was West Brom, and it just didn't. We didn't get that win that I think would have probably kickstarted it. Yeah, and I and I think that was that was massive. Probably looking back at it because it kind of gave you, even though we believed in it, it probably gave the fans the belief that it was working. You know that that big boost that three points does for you at the start of the season that makes you think, "Cool, here we go," and and that's what I I, I do think that we missed and. It would have been interesting to see what happened if Brendan stayed, but you know, sadly, it didn't work out. He obviously moved on to to Swansea, which which obviously then goes on to worse yeah. things. I mean, you say you know the players were really enjoying the sort of training stuff. Yeah. Do you think he still had the support of the dressing room, or there were sort of enough voices in there to think actually maybe a change? We need a change. I think it was it was tough because obviously Brendan was academy manager and he was loved about the place, but we'd not 
ha- not done what we wanted to the season before. And I think Nigel Atkins had the same thing. That if you don't start great, you know, it, it's very quick in football. And I think opinions start to change. And, you know, it just, it just didn't work. But did he lose people in the change room? I'm, 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 I'm not sure. We... Like I say, if you're not winning games, there's doubt creeps in everywhere, doesn't it? And the first one that gets looked at is the manager rather than us ourselves. So it would have been interesting to see what happened with Brendan, but it was um, it's never nice to, to see a manager go, and uh, sadly he did. But it, it was all it was quite an odd uh, an odd kind of happening when Brendan came in because just as Brendan came in or as Brendan came in, Reading had accepted a bid for me from Besiktas. Really? Yeah. So. It, it was. I was looking forward to Brendan coming in because obviously he, he'd kind of seen me play before I'd signed. So I was thinking, oh, maybe this is good for me. He'll he'll give me a go. And it literally came in and, and Hamo brought me in and said that Besiktas had, had made a bid and, and I was free to go. And I was completely shocked. Wow. I, Where's this come from? I, I want to stay here. And, and I was like, well, if I don't go, will can I stay kind of thing? Because it, <laughs> it was like the first, in, like, you know, the first experience of, not being wanted and, and being wanted by someone else. It was, it was, it was crazy. And I remember my agent, we went away to uh, Sweden, it was. And um, while we're still learning all of like, you know, Brett, that's what it is pre-season. We were learning Brendan's way. And to me thinking I wasn't wanted, you know, when I was really looking forward to kind of becoming a Redding player, was, you know, was gutting. And then we we had a we had a, a preseason friendly uh, just before we left, and, and Brennan played the, the lads that hadn't played as much, and I played right back, and you know I just give it everything I'd got as like a big, I say a big fu kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, this is what you're it's, missing out on. Yeah, like one of them, and and then the next week I got I got told that I was staying, and and where did I want to play? So it was a wow. uh, it was um that was a, a proper weird start of the season for myself and. And obviously, Brendan brought in Frank Lampard Senior, who was a character, and Dean Austin, who who I, Dean got I got really well with Dean, and it was just a shame, you know. Like I say, it's ne- it's never nice to see someone go, and everyone wants to play total football, and, and everyone would be lying to you if they didn't want to play that kind of way. So we were all looking forward to it, and it kind of just fizzled out, sadly. So how close were you to that move? I mean, did you sort of said, "Okay, I'll go"? Did you actually talk to them, or was it just sort of left hanging? Yeah, I, my agent was in, in talks with them. Look, as far as I know, the bid had accepted. They'd offered me a contract and I was sitting there thinking, well, let's get some more. No, oh, well, <laughs> um, yeah, I see. Yeah, obviously, that's, that's what you want. And I was thinking, well, if I am going to be moving country at, at 18 or 19, was I 19? Yeah. You know, it, it was a whirlwind. And, you know, I, I've done it now when I was, what was I, 26, 25 when I moved. And it's been the hardest thing in the world now, let alone what I could imagine it had been when I was 19. So I'm happy it didn't work out. And, and I got told, once the Reading obviously told me that they wanted me to stay, I, I, you know, that was me. I, I turned around straight away and was like, well, of course I'm not going, I'm, I'm staying here. So I was going to say, well, you, you buckled down and Brian McDermott came in. I mean, again, we talked about your sort of relationship with Amy. I mean, what was your relationship with Brian like? Because presumably you'd worked under him. What was it like when he came into the dressing room? Uh, yeah, I was very happy when Brian got the job because obviously when we were scholars, Brian gave me my first start um, for the resis. And obviously when you're a first year scholar, you're like, you can't even dream of that for another year. And he threw me in against, uh, it was Mill at home. I remember playing that and that was another tick off the list. And, and Brian gave me that opportunity. So I was, you know, really excited for Brian to come in and work with him. And well, we, we were on fire when, when Brian came in. He knew the club. Everyone loved Brian. And he was just the perfect man at the perfect time. And, um, you know, we shut up at the table and finished the season strong. We had that good FA Cup run, I think, as well. So he, he kind of just he gave the club a massive boost, which which was needed since the relegation. Yeah, he just sort of came in and the whole sort of atmosphere changed. Like you said, you went on that fantastic ride. If the season had gone on another 10 games, I think you would have made it into the playoffs. As a whole, Brian coming in and turning the way it started, it was like, right, here we go. We've got something good on our hands here. And, and on, yeah, like on we went. Yeah, and then you, you start the following season, you lose Gilfie early on, he joins Hoffenheim, and there's sort of a bit of a lull, and you start to think, uh, is it all going to go wrong? But Brian, to his credit, gets in people like, like your Ian Hartz, just brings yeah. in little players, and you go on again, and you just go again, and Longy suddenly bursts. I remember, start of that season, Shane was getting quite a bit of stick from Reading fans, because he wasn't finding yeah. the net, 
And suddenly, the second half of the season, he can't stop scoring. He only got twenty odd in six months. Yeah, it was. Um, oh yeah, that that was um, unbelievable season. Everyone was just on fire, and, and like say, Shane was getting us through games, and you know, digging us out of it. And and in his in, his, in Hunty as well, he was um, he was on fire, and it, it was just a great you know a great bunch of lads. It was great to be a part of, and it it still when I look back, you know, it's one of the best groups I've been a part of, and it was just that that winning feeling, and, and in the championship, as you see, you you win games in a run, and before you know it, you, you're right in the mix of it. So it, it sums up, you know, the championship, and and like you say, it's probably the start of Shane, and how he's then gone on, and since that little spurt, and you know, obviously he's he's doing great now at Southampton. Yeah, you get all the way, you get to another FA Cup quarter final. Put in, you know, play your heart out at City, can't quite get there. And then yeah. you get to Wembley again, that playoff semi final, that 3 0 win at Cardiff again, one well, of those nights I don't think any Reading fan will forget. Especially after the, because the first thing I think was a 0 0, it was quite cagey. And then you mm. did again, you just go there and, and I think it's Stephen Bywater, Longy goes up for that ball when it goes yeah. in. I mean, did, what, 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 what was your game plan going into that? Were you sort of thinking, oh, we'll try and keep this tight and nick it? Or we, did Brian sort of tell you, let's go out and try and actually win this? Because I, well, when we played Cardiff, I always remember it being quite a hasty affair when we played them, and it was. Um, remember, Ledge always had a little. I think Ledge had a little bit of trouble with them in in one of the games, and we didn't like each other. We didn't like their players. They didn't like us. So when we when we had them at home, it was like right, we've got to get a result here because going to the Cardiff grounds horrible. Like it's, you know, it's never good going there. It, it, you never, we've never really been doing great since, even before when I was a we. We played at Ninian Park and it was horrible and it was just not a nice place to go. So it was like, if we get a result at home, we'll go away and you know we'll grind out and we'll get through. And then when we drew at home, we were a bit gutted, really. But we, we knew that we could perform on the day and, and, and pick something out. And, and like you said, Shane had gone and got that goal and just give everyone a massive boost. And it was one of them days where you just know that you're going to win it from that start and from the way we started, we we knew it was going to happen, and uh, it was yeah one of the best wins I think I've been a part of, and just just brilliant, and and to know that Wembley was coming up, it was like something that we'd never expected. You just think you're going to be in the championship. You just you, you try not to think of it too much because we didn't really expect much of ourselves, and then before you know it, it's that like next game at Wembley. So it was um. It was unbelievable that game, yeah. And then, unfortunately, we all know what happened at Wembley. I mean, what what happened? Because it just sort of seemed that you you just got blitzed um, by Swansea. Yeah. Scott Sinclair, I think it was just people just seemed to be having uncharacteristically bad games. At least from my position yeah. in the seats. I mean, you yeah. again, you're on the pitch. What were you seeing? How did you suddenly find yourselves three 0 down? Oh well, obviously Swansea had had a great season and were unfortunate not to to go up straight away. So we were thinking, right, they're going to be a bit, you know, that team that, that always just misses out. There's going yeah. to be a bit. And I thought we were like, right, we, we can do this. We, we, we were going into that thinking, right, they're going to keep the ball all day long, but we're going to counter, we're going to get a goal, we'll grind it out like we, like we had done. And we started well. I know we started well. I think Shane had a chance. He or did, yeah. He had a chance early on. And we were like, wow, Shane's missed. Like, that, that's not been happening. They'd gone down the other end, and like you say, our defence had an absolute nightmare that day. Everything that was, you know, going through or, or down the sides. Was it Kish? Was it, was yeah, it Kish? he had a mare. And Kish, Griff, who'd been an unbelievable season, and Millsy, just that one game, it was it was gutting, do you know what I mean? To, them, to go in at 3-0, we were like, was it was it 3-0? Yeah, 3-0. 3-0 at half-time, yeah. We were like, what is going on here? And we walked in like, like what is like gobsmacked as I'm sure like it doesn't happen does it in like finals it even, doesn't no even even was it Tabby and, and Nigel Gibbs got themselves sent off as well at yeah, time seeing that we're like Tabby's been sent off like, <laughs> well, Tabby's the nicest guy in the world what's he, what's he going off at and I think I think Eamon was there as well, as well it was just all kicking off it was we were like this is our worst nightmare and we'd come in at 3-0 and and Joby was, you know, brilliant as as he was always, you know, getting into us. And, and Brian, the, Brian gave up one of his best speeches ever. He was just calm. He wasn't, he wasn't fuming at us. He was like, kind of forget everything, what's gone on. Just try and, not that we could, but just try and forget everything. Think of where you are and you've got 45 minutes now to go out and just 
change everything and just go out, get an early goal and just just see what happens. He was probably thinking inside, like, we ain't got a chance here. <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, you know, we went out, I think, was it Millsy? Was it Millsy? Yeah, Millsy gets, yeah, uh, no, Millsy, got, uh, it was the first one was the own goal. Well, Noel slash yeah. an own goal. Yeah, own goal, definitely. Yeah. Noel is to claim them. Um, <laughs> yeah. He claimed the ghost goal, didn't he? <laughs> Yes, oh, well, I think, was he on the pitch? I, I don't know. I think I tried to clean that at one point, but um, yeah. And then we got the second one, and and we we were like, right, it's meant to be. This whole season, everything that's happened, it's this is it. It's gonna happen. And and the ball dropped, so obviously in the edge of the air, and I've hit it. And and Gary Monk's got a touch. Was it? Yeah. Hit the puck. How many like, times have you replayed that, and it's gone the other way? Well, every time I go to Wembley now, I look at that goal, and I'm like, oh, you. Like, just look at it, and I'm thinking, come on. Like, just replay it all the time. Every time there's game at Wembley, and then Noel, not, you know, who was it? Someone made a last ditch tackle, was it Monk again, just to block it on the goal? And, and it was like that took a lot out of us. It was, I don't know if we created a chance after that, but especially with it being Brendan as their manager, it was like for the lads that kind of weren't involved as much as they were, it was like a big kind of like, come on, boys, like, let's show them. And did he did he have any words with you after the game? No, I didn't. I didn't see him after the game. Um, they were too busy celebrating. I, I, I don't know who did. I think maybe he spoke to Shane. I'm not too sure. But um, no, it was. Uh, we went into the change room after. We were absolutely gutted, as you can imagine. But you know, at the same time, we we knew we'd give it absolutely everything. But you know, like, like I say, the, the worst feeling ever. I was going to say, from a from a fan's point of view, though, I've sat and watched three of these playoff final defeats now, and yeah. those that twenty minute spell when you got those two goals and you hit the post, it's probably some of the most enjoyable minutes of any of the three of them. And we've led in in the other two that, yeah. that hope, and I, I you must have felt it from the pitch that the reaction when that second goal went in. Again, I don't think I've been in in a in a Reading crowd like it. It's electric. Yeah, oh, the feeling like don't get me wrong. When you play any match, it's you know you've got your adrenaline going, you're buzzing. And but when it's at Wembley and you saw we were shooting obviously into the Reading fans as well, weren't we? When we got mm. the goal, and, you know, just seeing it all erupt because you kind of it's weird. You kind of blank out the crowd when you're playing. Like you, you, you don't you can't imagine there not being anything around the pitch. But as soon as like the goal went in, you just see everyone go mental and you're just like, wow, like that influence that it gave us, it was like, right, we're going to do it and just seeing everyone go crazy. And then the second one, and it was like, it's going to happen. And we were like possessed after that second goal. And I remember running around on the pitch thinking I was like Ronaldinho trying to try and everything. <laughs> it just felt, I felt like a different person and going into it. And obviously once you hit that post, it's like, oh, it, it kind of... The air gets sucked uh, out. If that was, if it was meant to be, it was meant to be kind of thing. It kind of just killed us a bit going into that you know that it was a bit of a lull the last few and then I think obviously was it Barini was it did he go and get a goal at the Griff end? got uh, Griff gave away I think another penalty to Scott <laughs> and Scott Sinclair put it in okay yeah and then, then that was that was a good night wasn't it so yeah. it was a horrible day but it it was it was the end of that kind of we we're like oh gutted but you know when once we all regrouped and we went back after that game and we let our hair down and we all got together and, and was like, what a great season. And and it, and it took us into like the uh, un, unforgettable year the next season. You lost Long, uh, you lost Matt Mills as well in that summer, but you, you, you found a way again to get you yeah. going. Um, signed the likes of Alfie, Caspers at the back. But the key difference, I think, again, from a fan's point of view, was I think you were doing all right for most of the season. You were sort of hanging around the playoffs yeah. Then we had the whole takeover in, yeah. in January. Anton came in and, and gave Brian the money uh, to, to go out. Exactly. Yeah. How? What? What difference did he make from a player's point of view to that side? Was he, as far as you were concerned, as players, was he that X factor? Hundred percent, he was because you know J- Jason. Jason, I spoke to him today. Funny enough, he, he um he's all over the screens at the moment. He and oh, yeah. focus. I can't get enough of him at the moment. Um. But yeah, he was he was that Premier League player, and we hadn't obviously been in the Prem for for a few seasons, and and we'd all seen what he'd done in his career, and he wasn't playing at Blackburn, but he he was that kind of he was hundred percent someone that we thought if we could get in and score in, he would be he 
teams couldn't deal with him. And um, I think he showed that the first game was Bristol City, wasn't it? I think we, was it 1-0 we won? He scored one of the worst penalties. Oh, well, I think it was a, re- I think it was a dodgy <laughs> rebound. Yeah, it was terrible, yeah. It's David it, James. Yeah, he bubbled it in. And it was like, it was just like, uh, you know when you just know someone's going to score? He had, he had... He had that effect straight away. And he, he would, even at training, he'd kind of do stuff. And you're like, right, that's the next kind of quality that that we we need. And, and yeah, he, he brought it in the door. And Brian said, we can get him in, we'll be firing. And the same with when he brought Casper's in, he had so much confidence in Casper, who'd obviously won the league with QPR the season before. He, would, he said to all of us, I remember sitting down and going, this guy's a born winner and he will help us get to where we want to be and, and he was another one I think kind of an unsung hero in, in all that as well Are you saying that Bongani Kamalo didn't inspire that confidence in the team? <laughs> Bongani he was a lovely <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where he is now but he he didn't inspire much confidence <laughs> so no, he didn't get much of a chance did he bless him but um, no. he uh, he was one that we brought in from Spurs he was like right we got yeah, we got another captain, captain I think he was yeah and we were like right here we go and I remember I think it was Morrow said to me he went I'm not too sure about this one. <laughs> and, uh, and I went, all right, well, let's give it a go. And, and obviously it didn't work out. But, yeah, you know, you, you win something, you lose some. Indeed. Um, and, and you go on and you go on that absolutely, again, it's an incredible run that those Brian McDermott teams just seem to have in the second half of the season. You just won game after game after yeah. game. What point did you actually sit here and think, you know what, because West Ham and Southampton have been at the top two all season. What point did yeah. you go, we can actually catch these guys? I think it was more of a joke when we were kind of on that run. We were like, we were like, cool. If we keep going, we might, we might get in the playoffs. We might, you know, who knows? We might get in the playoffs again and have another Wembley go. And and we were all thinking, right, if we can get in there, we're going to rectify what just happened. And you know, we're going to win at Wembley. That would be the best feeling ever. And, and as we kept going, we we were just we couldn't believe it. I, I don't know how many we won in a row. I don't know, was it twelve or, or whatever it was. And we were looking at the other results and we just we started seeing that they were they were dropping a few points they were like you, know, you could see that people started talking about us and it was like oh I wonder what could happen and they just started getting um a few shaky results and before you knew it we were what was it we were turning up at West Ham knowing that if we'd won we were we were going into them was it into the automatic spots I think it was at the time and yeah it was it was unbelievable it I can't I can't describe how how it was when we were there. It, we were coming into training. Everyone loved each other. We were best <laughs> mates. We we loved Gaffer. The like Gaffer was one of us. Gibbo. Everyone was one, and and it was that feeling that you're going to kill yourself on your pitch for your mate next to you. And I'd do anything for Ledge. I would if whatever he I'd do everything if he was out of place. I would run my nuts off to get him for him. And everyone on that pitch was together, and and we knew we were just thinking of the impossible really. And you know, it, it, it was crazy. It was an unbelievable run and it was the best thing I've ever been a part of. Yeah, and, you know, you mentioned that West Ham game, the 4-2 win. Again, I talked about the bounce at Wembley, the bounce in that away end. I yeah. think Noel, Noel put us ahead. I think because yeah. Casper's got the equaliser and Noel put us ahead. Again, yeah. just fantastic stuff. And it's the next game that, that must be really bit, bittersweet for you, that, that yeah. Leeds game. Um, yeah. a, club, a club, I'm sure, holds... Nothing but fond memories for you. Um, <laughs> yeah. you, you go and is it Mike, Michael Brown, wasn't it? That yes, puts it in was. Hor- he had a that was a Neil Warnock side, wasn't it? And they were just, they were horrible yeah. in that game. Oh, uh, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know what it was. I, I'm, in that West Ham game, I'd broke my nose, so I'd, I'd gone in. I'd gone in for a tackle with Danny Collins, and he somehow I've gone in for a slide tackle, and I've come out with a broken nose. I'm, he need me in my in my face, so I missed probably one of the best ten minutes of you know the boys getting the goals after that. There ever was, so I was getting my nose cracked in by the doctor. Oh. I had to come on, and yeah, you know, I was on the pitch trying to get it cracked then and there, but I was like, oh, I'll be all right, and I couldn't see a thing, so I had to come off. So I missed that last ten minutes. Then we're going into that Leeds game. I remember having my black eye, and, and Danny Pugh absolutely smashed me early on in the game when the Leeds fans were calling it Sockgate, funnily enough. Um, and then it kicked, I think someone got sent off, didn't they, in the corner? they yeah, went for- Thompson, I think. Yeah, for, for not, even not the worst tackle of the day. It was, a, no. it was a bad one, but it wasn't horrific. Yeah, 12 think, minutes in. Yeah, I think Joby kind of jumped up in the air like he does and then 
I remember I'd rushed in, like, trying to, you know, because it was a bit like, whoa, calm down. Like, you've already, you've already done me. Like, you know, what is going on here? And like I said, it was a feisty lead side who wanted to, to put a halt on things. And we knew how much it meant. And, uh, yeah, and, and then after that, I've obviously gone to clear the ball. And then he's just come in and just completely swiped me out. And it, I, it, yeah, it, it ruined the end of my season. It was, you know, unbelievable seeing all the boys, but it, I wasn't there to kind of, you know, I wasn't the pitch at Brighton, then Southampton. You know, I'd, I'd been involved that whole season and to miss out, you know, in them last few games, it was like, oh, what have I, what have I done to deserve this kind of thing? So, you know, it, it was tough. It was. It, did he it ever apologise for it? Nah, of course he didn't. Nah, I, nah ne- never, never got a thing up him. But when we played Leeds at home that season, it, he'd done me in that game and I had to come off. So I don't know what I'd done to him, to be honest, but... Yeah, it it killed me that did, you know, coming off in that game. I, I only thought I'd sprained it really because it it was painful, but it weren't it weren't excruciating pain, which I've obviously suffered after, but I I'd gone into um the hospital. I'd gone in after and, and and then obviously I found out we'd scored. Was it Alfie? Did Alfie get a goal? Two two in the last sort of 5 minutes, I think. My memory and it, serves. And I was absolutely buzzing so I was like, "Yes, like I'll be back for the next game. This is nothing. It I'll be sweet." Because I'd sprained an ankle, rolled an ankle before, and it had always been fine. It kind of felt similar. And and after the game, Bobby, uh, the Bobby Wilkerson, like a great mate of mine, the Hungford Gaff, he, he he drove me to the hospital. And uh, you know, I was sitting in there having having great banter with him, like, "Oh, we're gonna go up!" Like all this like crack. And then the doctor came and he went, "Look, Jim, I've got some bad news, and you have broke your ankle." And I went, "Eh?" <laughs> like you having me on it. I went, Bobby, you told him to tell, tell him this. And I just burst out into tears. Like, cause I was like, this is going to be the best season ever for Reading. Like we're going to, we're going to go up. Like we, did, you killed like, no, nah, this can't be happening kind of thing. And I went, show me the scan. <laughs> so I still didn't I, like show me the x-ray. I still didn't believe him. He came in and I, I had a, you know, a fracture down, down my ankle and it, it just broke me. It uh, absolutely broke me. And then obviously I went in for surgery you know, a couple of weeks later, but I missed. Yeah, I was going to say though, I, I've got I've got memories now of you coming to the celebrations after we promoted. Hadn't you just gone under the knife and you were still a bit doped up and you got sort yeah. of wheeled into the dressing room? Yeah, I, well, I'm I, I still to this day. I absolutely I love Luke Anthony to bits, and he's you know an unbelievable physio. But he absolutely killed me getting booking my surgery for that day. I even said to him, I went, "Oh, we've got a game." Like, not I was going to play, obviously. He was like, it's like, yeah, but you'll be in early in the morning. And if you feel all right, like, patronising me. And I don't even think he thought we were going to, you know, win that game. He was like, come on, Forrest, like, we won't win it or we won't get what we need kind yeah, of Yeah, because West Ham were playing, I think, Bristol City. And I, I think if they had won or something, he wasn't yeah. allowed to wait. So I don't think, and, I think many people were actually expecting it that night. <laughs> yeah, he was like, oh, don't worry about it. And I think Forrest were doing all right. They had some good players. I think G-Mac was there, wasn't he, at the yeah, time? Yeah, as well. Yeah, and... And he, he he just dimmed it down a bit to me. So I was like, all right, we'll go for it. But before that, we'd had the Brighton away game with Hart he'd scored. And I've been at that, fortunately, with Ledge, because Ledge missed it as well. And we'd hung on for dear life and that got the goal. And we went to Southampton, which was... Amazing. Incredible. Yeah, like, that was one of the best, hardest, best viewings of my life. Um, we nearly got kicked out, I think, me and Ledge were having a fight with one of the Southampton fans behind us. <laughs> We were like on the brink there, the steward sent us to calm down. So that was unbelievable. Like the most exhilarating, you know, feeling ever watching that game. Because their team was unbelievable when you look at it. Yeah. Like, Lana, on to, Ricky Lambert. <laughs> yeah, Fonte. Never ending. Like that That team was, we thought were guaranteed with, was it Nigel as well? Was, we yeah. were like, like guaranteed they're going to be, like, well, I thought guaranteed they're going to win this. We shouldn't have said that. But yeah, it, um, <laughs> it was. Um, then obviously, yeah, going into that game and, and Luke had booked it in. And in my heart of hearts, I knew what was going to happen, but it was like, I couldn't really push it too much. And I think the, the surgeon who kind of was like doing it early as a favour, so I couldn't really turn around and go, no, I ain't having it kind of thing. I should have done really. But um, I was booked in for early morning and I didn't have my operation until about three in the afternoon. Wow. So I knew as it was dragging, they, they dosed me up before it. I don't know whether it was to calm me down because I was getting the shakes over the game and think, but I, I don't remember much of it before, just that surgery was delayed. And then 
I went down, come out of surgery, was obviously out of it. And then I woke up to the game. Like um, my mum was there, as she always is, uh, with the radio next to the to the um, my bed. And I was like, what's going on? And I was like, oh, we, we're drawing. And I think I've like snoozed back off. Then I woke back up again and it was to ledge scoring. <laughs> nice. And I, I'd never, uh, I'd never forget that because I think my brother was there and he flipped something. I think my sister was screaming in my face, and I was like, "What's going on?" Like, <laughs> it was, um, just that wouldn't be something that my family and I will always have, kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? It was just knowing that I wasn't there killed me, but being with my family at that moment, thinking we're getting promoted and I'm with my family, it was like a different experience, and. Um, as soon, I think I dozed off again after that. And then my mum woke me up and was like, game's finished, what do you want to do? And I was like, well, get me out of here. And she was like, oh, we can't really, can we? And then I screamed at her, like, get me the F out of here now. Um, and we nicked a wheelchair because it was obviously in the evening now. Yeah. It was probably nine, nearly ten, because we were always eight o'clock kickoff, annoyingly. And, um, yeah, like, wheeled me down, threw me in the car and, I just remember screaming at my mum, going, go faster, go faster, <laughs> missing it. And I could hear, like, I think it was Tim on the radio saying, and the boys are going up to get their trophy, and it was killing me. And then, oh. like, it still does. Like, getting worked up here, it was, um, oh, the worst, but the best feeling ever, throwing up morphine. I mean, like, oh. <laughs> giving me a plastic bag, which, I, which funny enough, had a hole in it. So I'd oh, lovely. So I up in the, in the passenger seat. And then we turned up to Reading Stadium and it was going crazy. And I think I told a few fans to do one because I was trying to, I was obviously out of it. Sure, they understood. There. Yeah, and I was like, get them away, get them away. And they pushed me through, managed to get me downstairs and then kind of come out the little lift there. And I'd seen Gibbo and, and Noel in his pants. And, <laughs> you know, it was, um, it was still is to this day, I'd say one of the worst things in the world, never being able to go up and hold that trophy in front of the fans after playing so many games. But it was uh, just great to be there. Do you know what I mean? It was, um, it it just made it a lot better seeing, you know, my best pals in football who still are. And Gibbo giving me a big hug. It was, uh, like I said, you'd seen the video then, I was crying then, I was a, I was a wreck. But uh, no, it was it was the best moment I've had in, in football by a mile, even though I was on crutches with a broken ankle and even the celebrations going off obviously on our little holiday afterwards together it was uh it was interesting only having one leg but it was a uh, you know an unforgettable experience and you know i'll always have that get social with the boys find them on twitter at the tarhurst end and facebook.com forward slash the tarhurst end so yeah you get up to the premier league um you've got this supposedly amazing new takeover uh, with Anton in charge, everything's looking rosy. Everyone's looking great going into the season. You added a few. You, you got in Guns. You got G Mac, um, yeah. and then, but then there are a few others that seemed not really ready in signings. You had your Pavel Pogrebniaks, your, your Danny Guthrie's. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we know now that sort of Anton was having a, a say behind the scenes. Did you guys know in the dressing room that maybe these weren't Brian's guys? Some of the guys that were coming in. Yeah, I, I guess a little bit. And I knew we, Brian really wanted Chris and, and Gareth because I was with Chris and Gareth on in America, funnily enough. And, you know, as you do and you see, like, lads that you know or played against, we just got chatting. And, and I was like, cool, any chance you two coming to Reading or what? And, and they went, oh, funnily enough, you know, we, it, it could be happening. So I, I, I knew that them two were, were kind of coming in the door and I was kind of pushing their case because they were obviously very good players. And, you know, for me... I think Chris has proved it recently, like what with his performances for Wales, you know, he, he could easily walk into a Premier League, one of the Premier League teams. And Gareth on his day is unplayable. Like he's scored, I think, was it five and five recently? So he, they, they, were, they were good signings for Reading, you know, we weren't going to appeal to the masses, you know, the team coming up. And, you know, they were good, solid signings, Reading signings. And, and obviously, yeah, then, then we got linked with Pog, who would have been amazing for Fulham I think he'd scored seven in nine was it with like seven attempts on target he'd scored seven or something outrageous yeah, so like four against Wolves or something like that <laughs> yeah so we were like wow that's a statement obviously being Russian it was it was one of the things so like at the time I, I remember him coming in and and he was that kind of Premier League quality that you know maybe ne not necessarily a, a Brian signing but you know I'm sure 
Brian will say, you know, he was a top quality player. Didn't score as many as he would have liked to, have, or we would have liked to have. But you know, he was a great lad, and, and obviously we signed Gus. You know, sadly it didn't work out for Gus with us at Reading. But you know, there's no denying how good Gus is, and and I played with him obviously quite a bit when when Nigel came in, and he's a top quality player on on his day once again. But you know, we, the way we played, was he like you say a Brian signing? I'm not too sure. Only, only Brian could tell you, but. I, I, I think we. Look, I think everyone will look back at it and be like, I just wish we kind of added a couple more. Yeah. You know, we didn't give it a go really. I don't think like you see teams coming up now, and I know like the money now has has changed getting into the Premier League and stuff, but we didn't give it a go, and I think that's what's got in for for us as a group. But I know that you know like, we've done well in the Championship. We all done well in the Championship, but you you need that quality to kind of you know push you that little bit further. And, and don't get when we gave it our all, but it wasn't enough. And maybe if we did have you know, two or three signings to to come in and nick us a goal or nick us a point in in certain situations. I reckon we would have just stayed up. We weren't massively off it. No, because you you had those early... I remember some of the early games in that season. You had that Newcastle game with the Denver bar handball and you had going 2-0 up at Swansea as well. You were in games. It just couldn't get that win early in uh, the season. Very frustrating, yeah. Even Chelsea, like, I'll always... Yeah. When people ask me about, you know, being in the Prem and how was it... that Chelsea game was massive. Like when you look back at it, I know it was the second game of the season, but we went two one up away at Stamford Bridge, and, and they were on the ropes. Piercy missed a header, which I still give him grief about. <laughs> and uh, we we made a change. We made a tactical change, and we went. I remember I came off at Alfie, and we kind of went from four five one to four four two, bringing Alfie on, and it was a bit like, oh, we're hanging on here, kind of. Do you know what I mean? It was a bit. It's always kind of like last year's blueprint. And like Brian loved it. Like Brian will all, like Brian's unbelievable. And we've, we've earned so many wins from, you know, his substitutions massively. Even the points we did pick up in the Prem were a lot from Brian's substitutions. But, you know, that one, I think if we could hang on there, it would have been massive for us. Just a, a confidence boost, you know, for everyone. Maybe I think the chance window was still open. If a yeah. team of players could have seen that we'd, you know, picked up a win there, it would have been like, oh, you know they they've got a chance they got a good chance, and it it, it I think that was quite a big uh, quite a big one for us that we didn't uh, that we didn't win that. I know so early in the season we had so many chances to rectify it, but like you say, Swansea we two new up, and we came into the change room after that one. I remember Joey uh, Joe began ape at us because he was like we nicked a draw there, like, and a couple of lads were saying we've done well to get a point there, and we were like we were two new up. If that's our mentality. We're gonna struggle. We need to win them games. Like, and I know Swansea were, were a good team, and you know when they were flying to be fair. But I remember it was nicking two goals in that, and Noel had a great goal that was as well. And you know, thrown it was just them. Like, what, you're looking at four, five, six points there, and we would have stayed up. It's them small errors in the Premiership that we we got found out about, which was you know still gutting really. Yeah, like I say, the win just didn't come, and then the results and the beatings just kept coming. And I remember it got to around Christmas time. Because um, I think you were injured. Weren't, did you pick up an injury at Liverpool? Yeah, uh, I tried to do Stevie G again, which didn't work out. <laughs> uh, yeah, I went in for, you know, one of them adrenaline's pumping. You know, you're playing Liverpool at Anfield and I went in for a 50-50 with him and my medial ligament went, my fragile body. And, it, um, yeah, it just popped a bit. I felt horrible. And then I remember jogging after and I think I was running next to Suarez at the time and I was like, this is not for me. Something's wrong here. And then, uh, yeah, I'd done my medial, so I missed um, I missed a bit of football, sadly. Uh, at least but, you got, at least you got one win at Anfield. Yeah, it was uh, yeah frustrating to get injured, especially in the Prem. You know, you don't know if you're going to play in the Prem again after you see it. Do you know what I mean? It was uh, another annoying contact injury. I, I've never pulled my hamstring. I've never done anything like that. Everything I've done has been a break or you know a ligament injury, and it kills me. I have a go at my mum about it. I'm like, what have you done to me? Oh. What, <laughs> what is going on? But no, it's frustrating that it's always. Um, them injuries, but no, it was gutting that we got that we went down. And like you say, I think towards the end of the season, it was a, uh, you know, Brian going and then another new way of football coming in. It was a, uh, we kind of the writing was on the wall for us, I'd say. Yeah, another end of an era. You did have that great January though. That some of those come, that comeback win over West Brom, getting those yeah. two goals against Chelsea for a, for a minute, I just thought, you know what, we could do this. And I think. Then we played, yeah. was it Wigan at home and just got an absolute stuffing? Uh, and then it was kind of like... In the early doors, yeah. Uh, 
because it was that one we had to win. And, and yeah. like you say, Brian get manager of the month in he January. Did. Yeah, and Alfie won it at the player, Alfie, I think. Yeah, and then that old curse came into play. And yeah, downhill after that. It was um, it was gutting, you know, coming in every day. And you've got a big game coming up and you're like, we've got to win this one, we've got to win this one. And it goes and you've got to win the next one. It's it's uh, not a forgiving league. It's it's ruthless. It isn't like the championship. You know, when you've got, you lose and you've got a game on the Wednesday, you're like, well, we'll win that. And you kind of get it out of your system quickly. You're waiting a long week in the Premier League. And that was, I'd say that was a lot of getting used to us as well. We didn't have much Premier League experience and even waiting that long week was killing us. Do you know what I mean? It was uh, it was completely different. What was it like when Brian um, did, did lose? I mean, he talked about the feeling when Brendan lost his job, but for Brian, I mean, like you say, about six weeks before, he was manager of the month. Did you yeah. guys sort of get the feeling that the end was coming or was it a bit of a, a shock? I think it's different because in, like you say, if, if Brian probably, I don't know what the saying is, you know, when you do so well and then you kind of, for your own achievements, you kind of set yourself up to not shot himself in the foot. But it was tough because he'd done so well and he got us to something we'd never imagined off with that group. To then lose his job was tough. And it was tough for everyone because he'd been through that unbelievable his first season and then the, the playoffs, then win the league. For it to kind of finish the way it did was, was gutting. But in the Premier League with Anton, you know, I guess he was the decision maker and... It was, um, he would need, Anton needed to stay in the Premier League, didn't he? And I guess yeah. that's all it all out with, you know, his troubles. So mm. he needed to stay in the Premier League and, and he thought he had to, you know, get, get someone else in. And, you know, it, it was probably too late. Yeah. But you never know. Brian would stay. We, we could have stayed up. You just don't know. But obviously then uh, Nigel came in. Yeah, Nigel comes in. And you had a couple of good moments at the end of that season. It was a good, it was a heroic draw with Liverpool um, where... Alex McCarthy had a worldie, yeah, and, um, and then you you scored in that win at Fulham, and that was still yeah. one of the one of the best away performances in recent years. It was, I think, yeah. Howell got a couple. Mm -hmm. Started to look at that team, and I thought, if yeah, if you play that way next season, you'll be all right. Nigel came in, and uh, his first game was at Arsenal, um, and we got absolutely annihilated, and we were like, oh, and we were thinking, oh, the new managers come in, like, and, and, and as any player does when a new manager comes in, you want to give your best, and that was our. Uh, that was our showing to him, so it wasn't a great, you know, start to get off to. But he got us play um, playing in a different way, and in training we were working in different things and, and stuff that I hadn't done before with with a coach. You know, I I got on really well with Nigel, and I, and I loved his training. And um, it was um, like you say, we had little. I think there were signs that you know there was there was good stuff coming. I, I, mean, I even remember Man City coming to us, and they done us. But you know, we we came off thinking. We just played like one of the best teams in the world there, and, and we give a good account of ourselves. Um, Fulham, like you say, four two, and Alex saved us with that other one. It was, you know, there, there were signs there, but it was just all too little, too late, really. But yeah, that Fulham game, we we were great in that. It was, it was end to end, and we played some great stuff in that. Yeah, yeah, and then they have a chance to rebuild in the summer, and for a while it looked great because I think straight away they went out and started. They brought Danny Williams in, uh, mm -hmm. Wayne Bridge, everyone's favourite jungle camp mate. And, yeah, uh, and of course Royston all yes. pitching up and you think oh great this you know he's, he's got the money he's overhauling the squad and then it stopped I just remember it absolutely mm -hmm. stopped nobody else came in but it didn't matter because you started that season really well um, yeah. I'm sort of I'm, lo I'm looking now at the games you played in that season I think you only played in one defeat and that was a d on a dodgy pitch at Blackpool yeah and, and hit the bar yeah I remember that one yeah, yeah. and we had yeah. that I remember watching the three all game with Watford and thinking mm -hmm. this team is all because you were all you guys were all, I think you were th two was it two nil and three one up you scored a couple yeah yeah, yeah. well I claimed one of them it was not mine but oh. I did get it thanks Jesus to another goal panel was still giving it to you yeah. though so there you go yeah. and was uh, right there so I got given that one um, yeah we we like I say we we had a great preseason I was loving you know the the new stuff we were playing you know we had like little plays set up that were coming off it was it was. Like I say, going in with that Brendan season, we had a kind of similar, you know, feeling like the ones that had been with Brendan, like myself, Joby. We were like, right, yeah, we've got a crack here. And we started off well. And there was a couple of games that we drew that we should have won, like your Watford one. And I think we did we we went away to Bolton. And, yeah, and we, drew and we should have won that. We battered them. So we were like, right, we turned them. 
you know, them little ones into wins, we've got a big chance. And we weren't really scared of anyone in the league. There was no one to be scared of. Um, she was coming down from the Prem and we were confident. But, yeah, sadly, it, it, didn't, it didn't finish well at the end of the season. But, yeah, bringing, bringing Royston in was, you know, I still look back at it and it was so random. What was he like on the training ground around the club? Because uh, he's earned the reputation, fairly or unfairly, for fans as being a lazy player that was earning far too much money and just wasted his talent. From yeah. you, you played with him. I mean, what is that a harsh? Is that harsh assessment, or did it, did the players sort of have roughly the same sort of feelings? The first feeling, I guess, for everyone was like, we've got a former Real Madrid player coming in here. I wonder who his mates are. <laughs> but no, he, he came in and, and he and he showed glimpses. But the one thing with Nigel and, and Cros and Dean was that you you uh, you put in everything you had in the training pitch. You you had to, you know, you, you give it everything you've got every day and. Um, of course, there were, he came in and he wasn't fit, and uh, <laughs> I think it came out on his first day at training. I think I don't know if we had a bleep test, something he was late, and we were like, "Oh, here we go." But he, he had to, he, obviously, in any player that signs for Real Madrid's got unbelievable ability. Otherwise, the best team in the world don't sign you. But everyone always wants to be that person, don't they? That kind of gets that out of someone, and unfortunately, it, it didn't work out, and uh, it, it was a shame because you know he was a nice guy, different different to everyone else um he had his own way of doing things and, and things like that as i'm sure a lot of players do but he, he showed glimpses i think it was the leads away was it leads away he got a couple in that season and and i think everyone was like oh here we go he's, he's gonna be on fire now and just never that consistency wasn't there which which was gutting really for us no for you personally again Leeds uh, and lots of people point to that game i think because you got injured i think royston got injured in the same game and there might have been somebody else as well and Danny and Williams might have got something in that as well. Possibly. But yeah. you won the game, but the cost to you was obviously massive. What yeah. what exactly happened to you? And, and then why were you out for such a long period of time afterwards? Well, uh, I remember we'd started off the game well. And, and, and we like it's, uh, I'd started off the season, maybe some of the best football I'd been playing. I'd got a couple of goals. And I was like, Nigel kind of installed this confidence into me and Dean that that you know, you, Jim, you can get goals. You can like you can get around the pitch. You know, you need to get more goals. You kind of demanded that off me rather than just kind of being happy to be that guy that does the running for someone else or the guy who always do a job for the team. Who I hate. I hate that guy. Um, so you know, he, I got a couple of goals and he really made me feel that I could. You know, the, the best I'd ever felt as a footballer. He gave me that love that kind of a lot of. I, not a lot of, but I guess some of the previous managers probably did think, like I guess a few fans did, that Jem will always give 100%, but he's probably missing that bit of bit of quality. But he made me think I could do that. So when I did get some some of them goals, I was thinking, oh, here we go. There's something in me that I didn't know I had. I'm going to start to prove it. And I remember starting that Leeds game, I was feeling a million dollars. And then that ball went past me and I've gone with my right leg to slide in and, and just heard... Obviously, it was Ross McCormack who needs to lose some pounds because he's ruined my, my career. But he, it just he landed on my knee and it obviously bent inwards and it just felt I can't ah oh, just a crunch pop snap. Um, wow! Just it's like I, uh, you can't remember pain, but what I do remember it, it was it was you know I, I knew I knew then and there and. My sister had done a cruciate when she was young and she always told me what it felt like kind of thing. And it was like, that's that. And yeah, I went, uh, obviously I, I knew instantly that was me done for, for however long it was. And it was, yeah, the toughest mental challenge apart from the one I'm having at the moment that, you know, I, I've had to deal with and that everyone beside me and, and the lads probably have had to had to deal with it was a 50 i think 15 months in all you were out and i remember obviously right for the title list and as we do you know it was like you would always hear you know nigel would get asked every week by a, a charles watts you know yeah. how's how's jem getting along and, and it would always get to the point of oh jem's back in training he's, he's yeah. on the grass he, he's kicking <clears> a ball and then it would be oh there's been a setback what was um, what was going wrong well i don't think it ever come out but that injury was you know when you're speaking with a physio and you know it ain't good. Even after like a couple of days yeah. after, my knee had at, like had ballooned up. Um, it was huge, so we all knew it was bad. And without telling me, they knew I'd done it. Do you know what I mean? They knew I'd done my cruciate, my medial, my ligaments, my meniscus. I'd, it wasn't just your standard 
ACL be back in nine months. It was everything. It was your full and, English uh, of injuries. It was everything. Yeah, it was, my leg, my knee was a was a car crash. It was, uh, and I knew like straight away there was always that bit of doubt in me and my head that you know this could be the end. And it was tough, especially only being twenty. I think I was twenty four at the time. Just kind of like you know looking forward to a great season. It, it proper took the wind out of myself. And um, I remember going in for my uh, MRI. I couldn't have it for quite a few days after because you have to wait for the swelling to go down before you have it. Mm. And we were just waiting and waiting and doing everything we could to get the swelling down. And it just wasn't going. So I was like, my knee's busted. Like, what is going on? And eventually I went I went for the scan and, and I was in the MRI scan and, and the guy had come in after about 10 minutes and said, we just got to take a break here. We're struggling to find your ligament. And I wow. went, what? Like, right. Then he came back in, done it another 20 minutes, done it. I came back out and... And Matt Hirons, who's still at Reading now, he, he went, what happened? And I went, well, mate, he's come in and he said that he couldn't find my ligament. Well, what does that mean? And I seen his face just like, you know, he didn't want to tell me. He was like, oh, that kind of happens now and again. And I was like, that doesn't happen. Like, <laughs> like just tell me, like, come on, just tell me. And then I was waiting and waiting. And then uh, Luke ran me up. I think it was th- that evening because I couldn't obviously do anything. So I just went home, put my leg up and iced it and stuff. And he went, look, mate, you've... um." Yeah, you've you've done your cruciate and your medial. Um, sorry, mate. You know, and I, once again, I was always I broke down. I was gutted. Um, proper tough. Like, yeah, I'd obviously been out for little spells before. The ankle was tough because it was of what what kind of situation we were in. But I was only probably only missed four or five games because the end of the season. So even I missed a quite a big period of time. It was lucky that it was the end of the season, so I hadn't missed much. But I was like, I'm missing the season here. So I said to Luke, how long is this one? And he went, look, Jim, we're probably looking at 12 months for this one. And oh. I was like, oh, like that's, that's, a, that's done me in, that is. Because you, you always see, didn't you, in, in like all the press is always like, crucial ligament, six months. And I was yeah. like, not six months. Like, but Luke was like, it's never six months. It, it should never be six months. And it should never be nine months, um, which I've now learned a lot about knees. It should never even be nine months. It should always be around a year. So after I got told all that, it kind of was like, Right, it's going to be 12 months, but after the you'll be sweet kind of thing. So I went to see um, Dr. Williams, who's the best in the business um, at, at saving my knee. And even after having this chat with Luke, Luke, I remember sitting down with him on the first kind of like time he'd had a look at it, look at it when we were trying to just, like go over surgery and stuff. And he, and he mentioned, you know, we're hopeful that we can get you back playing. And I was like, looked at Luke and I was like, Oh, it's that bad. You hadn't, at that what? point, you hadn't even thought that there was a chance. Yeah, like, uh, you know, you kind of always think of the worst. So I was like, oh, yeah, it's going to be a year. All right, it's going to be a year. But then when we spoke to the surgeon, he'd said, you know, we, we're going to, you know, we're confident, we hope we can get you back playing. And I was like, what? Like, I was, didn't really, reg- like, it, it was like, kind of just went blank off that. And I looked at Luke, and Luke was just, as you know, as they do, kind of chatting in doctor terms and physio terms and then I, I left I went Luke is this like is this bad and he was like look Jim it ain't great look but we're co- like we're confident like you'll come back don't worry mate you'll be fine so then then obviously the the rehab begun and uh yeah it was um it, yeah it broke me like I, it it ruined you know I, I'd still say it I, I'd love to have thought what could have happened that year Nigel said to me you know when that season finished and we had the meeting. He, he was like, you know, we, we would have, which hurt me. He was like, we would have been promoted if you'd played this year, Jem. And, you know, he wanted to make me feel better about myself, but at the same time, it didn't make me feel great as well. So it was hard. It, it was really hard. I'd, I'd had the first initial uh, operation. I remember putting the picture out and the boys they had their team photo, you know, with, with me, with, with all my face and that, which was, you know, a great sign of support from them. And, and after the first operation, I, would, I was meant to be out the next day, but I was in for three days because um, of how much pain I was in. And, you know, the swelling once again was what hadn't kind of they hadn't experienced before. So I was sitting there like in the hospital bed, you know, three days in now thinking, what is going on? Like, like I'm done here. And it was, um, like I say, the most the, the hardest mental battle or challenge I, well, I hope that I'll have to go through. 
it was tough. And then I then I had another operation to clean it out. I don't know how, how many actually come out of the press that I needed. So I had another one to clean it out a few months after. And then we were at probably the year mark. And I was back training and I felt amazing. I felt strong. I was back. And I'd done a session with Dean Wilkins and my knee had ballooned up. And Luke was like, right, we've got to take it easy now. You know, let it settle down. You're doing, like, maybe we're pushing it a bit too much. Swelling won't go down. Went for another MRI. I'd torn my meniscus oh. again, which, oh, like, then, like, you can imagine, like, it was at 12 months at this point. So I was thinking, right, what now? What next? So I went in for another operation. They kind of sewed up my meniscus. And then it was another two months out, which I, I don't know what we're at now. And then, I remember it was Middlesbrough game, was yeah, it? You played, yeah, you yeah, came on for a few few minutes at the end, didn't you? Came on, I was like, oh, I'm back. And um, I think at that time, I think Nigel had gone. Yeah, Steve uh, Clark was back, in, was in charge. Yeah, so even that was tough, you know, because Nigel had given me the armband at the start of the season where I couldn't even be on the pitch. I tried to be as supportive as I could around the teammates, but at the same time thinking, you know, about myself, um, thinking, you know, what, what can like being given the armband when you're so happy to get given it, but in that situation was really tough to be in. So when obviously Nigel had gone, who you know was one of the best managers I've worked with, who who showed so much faith in myself, had gone. That was tough <laughs> as well to see him go. Um, and then obviously Steve Clark came in, and then I hadn't played for a year. I'd now meet another manager. I'm captain. I was in another awkward situation to be thinking, am I going to lose the armband? What does he think? Do you know what I mean? But he showed like massive support for me and just said, look, take your time. You know, I've known people that have had the injury, like take as much time as you want. You know, and I was like, nope, I'm going to be back soon. Don't worry, I'll be back. And then I came back in the middle of a game, you know, played some minutes and was back on the bench. Was that when, yeah, we had like, was it Bradford in the FA Cup then? Yes. Um, and I was on the bench for that and I think Fulham away as well. And I was starting to get really annoyed, as you can imagine. You know, I was captain of the club. I think we brought in, I think Chalaba was in on loan. Yeah, Nathan we, Ake as well came in, I think. Yeah, Nathan come in, who's, you know, top player. But, you know, I was thinking that I've been out for 15 months here. I've done everything I possibly could to get back, thinking my career was kind of over. You know, I've done everything I possibly could. The boys, like, you know, we we weren't doing great in the league. I was thinking, give me a chance. Like, you know, this is killing me. Like, it's hard enough being injured but you know you can't affect it. Whereas being fit after that injury and, and knowing you're not getting a chance to affect it is like a whole other mental game. So we, I then pushed him and pushed him. And after the Bradford quarterfinal game, we were 3-0 up. And I was thinking, why am I not coming on here? Like, mm. give me that. Let the fans see me. Let me get a bit of buzz from the fans. Let them know that I'm not here. You know, not doing anything kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Because so, we, again, from a fan's point of view, we, we weren't sure if you were fit. Because it was yeah. a case of you'd been out for so long and sort of coming back and not coming back again. And there was a lot of question for the fans is, is Jem fully fit? So you, you, in your mind, you were fully ready to get fully back in around that sort of February, March like, time. I was peed off. Like, I asked, like, what I'm, if I'm not playing, I ain't happy. Of course, in any situation, you're there for the team, but you always want to play. And, you know, I, I wanted to play in them games. I was like, I'm back fit. I've, I've worked 15 months here. I'm captain of this club. I love this club. I want to get on that pitch and... And show everyone I'm fine and, you know, just, you know, show them that I'm not one of them guys that kind of, you know, picking up his money or, do you know what I mean? Or happy, yeah. do you know what I mean? I want to be seen as that person. So when I was on the bench, I was like, well, we're freeing you up here at, at Bradford. Get me on. Like, <laughs> come on. Like, you, you, this is the worst thing ever. And, and that was, I'd been at the low of the lows that whole time being injured and not knowing if my career was in balance. But coming off, not coming on in that game broke me mentally quite a lot and I went home back to my mum's after and I was sat there for two hours in silence I, I, I was thinking all this what I've been through and I'm not getting on in you know a good moment for the club and it was the perfect moment and do you know why you weren't weren't getting picked do you think at that point Steve maybe already had in his mind that you weren't going to be at the club next year or or was there something else? Or was it a fitness thing? I mean, what do you think was keeping you out? The thing is, I was training. So I was like, well, if I'm training and with the boys fully contact, then I can, you know, that that's your, your marker, isn't it? You, you train full contact, you then get on the pitch. Like, that's the next, obviously, progression. And um, 
you know, I, I don't know why. I, I, I guess he, he must have thought it was my fitness or he didn't want to maybe after being so long as I had been out, he was trying to look after me, which you can understand. But after the Bradford game, he come up to me and said, what's up? And I said, what do you think's wrong kind of thing? Do you know what I mean? It was, yeah. um, as you can imagine, anyone in, in my position, if he, I was like, I want to play. I need to play football. I've not waited this long to not play. So I think I think I even said, you know, if you're not going to play me, I want to go out and loan. I want to go and show you I want to play for this club and I'm mm. fit. I'm back. I can be back to, you know, where I was. And he said, right, there's a game... He said, "There's we, there, I remember we played Huddersfield before in the FA Cup around, I don't know, was that around? Yeah, oh, I forgot even before yeah. that. We yeah. Red Field in, in the FA Cup, I then played a friendly, I think three or four days after that or whatever it was, and I'd got an injury in that, which set me back. It was just never ending. Mm. Do you know what I mean? When, when their months were coming, it was like my knee had bloomed up again and they were worried. So I could, I, well, you can't understand why he didn't want them to throw me straight back in, but... I guess you can also understand my wanting to get back into it as quick as possible. So, yeah, like that, that was how it was going. And, and it was, you know, after that, after it bloomed up again, it, it was then obviously the Ryan Royals thing had, had came about and, you know, perfect timing. I managed to get back for that game, funny enough. So that was... Um, that was my comeback, that Blackburn game. Yeah, and I remember as well, you, you, you came on at Watford and scored possibly the best yeah. goal of your Reading career. It was a 4-1 a defeat, but it was just an awesome goal out of nowhere. That was, Yeah, sorry, yeah. I lost, uh, he put me on the knee for that one. He, he, <laughs> took a really, he took a really youthful side. It was between the two cup ties. It was just for the replay, yeah. wasn't it? Oh, uh, we turned up with a team that uh, I'd, we probably should have given the fans back their money for, for that performance. It was... Um, it was a poor performance when you look back at it. But yeah, we came on, we nicked a goal and then we missed a big chance where we could have got back into the game and obviously it was just a bad day. But yeah, to come on, you know, get a goal, it was like, here I am, like I'm ready. <laughs> that means it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a great feeling and, and it, it, was, it was great to be back on that pitch and it, like I say, being on that football pitch is home to me. So it was, um, that, was that was brilliant. And then, like I say, like the walking out with the armband for the first game with Ryan, you know, it, 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 it had been a horrible period in my career, but to walk out with Ryan and after what the club had done for him and seeing what he's going through, you know, it puts everything into perspective. So it was, um, it, that, that was a, a great day for me, even though we didn't win. But yeah, that whole kind of, I think that general thing for Reading showed, you know, what, what a club it is. I think, you know, it is a family club and, you know, we, it's that that showed everything what's good about what's good about the place and and, and reading getting behind him because no one no one would do that for 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 someone i don't think anyway yeah the community work that again and that sort of your generation does i was at um, a star event recently and we had someone from from the community trust coming in and just pointing yeah. out some of the, the projects and stuff and you guys going into schools and working with you know kids um you have sort of learning disabilities or, or people that maybe don't fit in at school. Some of the work the club does behind the scenes. I mean, foot, foot, football, so I mean, you get the stories like Wayne Rooney on the back page, back yeah. pages and that stuff obviously makes headlines, but it's not the stuff you see like with Ryan's rules and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. All the hard work that you guys are doing when you're not giving up your own time after training. I don't think yeah. that gets, that gets enough attention sometimes. Yeah. Like we, we owe it to everyone. Do you know what I mean? Like fans, you know, you know, they, they, they Reading's their their life and their world, isn't it? And and, and when you, it was Dara who, who's unbelievable behind the scenes at the club with all the community stuff. She she let myself know about about um you know the school there and and just to go down and and then you know just to you after being what I'd been through as well, it made me I kind of appreciate you know just seeing what people do go through in their lives and and I've got it rosy compared to to what other you know young kids who, who'd love to be footballers kind of go through so you know to to meet him and his family and, and just to see what the club did for for him and um, creating a share it, it's um you know unbelievable and reading is you know one in a million for that and like say the Wayne Rooney stuff you know you see that on the back pages it's you know like it, that guy does unbelievable stuff behind the scenes I saw he done that that uh the Billy Sharp in the Sheffield United fan um 
you know, the last celebration for Kaz or for Kasabian, um, you know, it, where's that on the paper? Mm. <laughs> it does annoy me when I when I see stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? It, it, but it, that's all. That's the way it is, isn't it? I guess. But no, not enough is um, is shown from from what people do for their for their clubs. No, that Ryan, what a lad he wasn't, and to see him win that Pride Reading Award. Uh, yeah, I was meant to, I was meant to go and. Um, I knew he'd obviously just before that he'd won it, so I was going to turn up and give him the award, which had been planned, but I wasn't allowed at the time, sadly, to go back. But um, no, it, it was great to see him and uh, you know, brilliant, yeah. Well, your, your Reading career nearly had the fairy tale list of fairy tale endings um, with that semi final against us. So you mentioned that how gutted you were not to play against Bradford, huh? but how did it feel coming on in that game? You know, Reading at that point, one all, you're taking Arsenal to extra time. Yeah. Did, did you think you were going to, did you? Was there that feeling at full time? You know, we're going to win this now. Like I say, we kind of like our recent history. Of Reading was like the FA Cup. We'd done really well, and we'd kind of turned the form guide on the on its back. We we it was nothing to do. Like we knew that we could go out and beat anyone on our day. And I remember before the game, uh, you know, I was pushing for a start. I just played the last couple, and Steve Clark pulled me and said, "You know, look, you've just come back. <laughs> I think we just played Bournemouth on the yeah, day yeah. Tuesday." and he's like look you played you played a lot of football there you've just come back look we're at Arsenal it's the F like do you know what I mean I was like oh you're killing me come on mate give, <laughs> give me something but um, yeah like it was an unbelievable feeling to come on at 1-1 and you know it was such a shame with how it went and, and sadly obviously one of Fed's last um, your last moments uh, so yeah it was cutting how it ended and another Wembley defeat so I'm due I'm due one day to go back there and pick up a win. We're all we're all due one. We keep going. <laughs> we keep going as fans down there. Yeah, yeah. You, you you still feature up to the season, and I think you started in that three 0 win at Derby as well. Yes, we talked right at the start um, of of this talk about the decision to leave Reading. At, at that time, did did you walk off the pitch that day thinking I've played my last game for Reading, or was there still hope for you that you might stick around? I think a big uh, a big thing in my a big thing in my head was in in January when I was uh, you know I, I was still struggling to get back and having these little annoying you know things coming up with my injury you know I, I remember I remember one day and, and my agent had said look we're speaking to the club today and and I was like well I've got six months left on my deal here like I'm I was thinking I'm struggling really like do you know what I mean like it's you know, I guess it never comes out as much as, um, you know, being a footballer and, you know, your contract's coming and when you're injured and just, you know, I was very hopeful that maybe something could have get, could have got sorted out before the end of the season. You know, I, that's what I wanted. I was captain of the club. I've been there since I was 15. You know, I, I, I knew I, I earned good money at Reading. I wasn't expecting the same, like nowhere near the same, if I'm honest, but you know, I, I just kind of wanted the club to come to me and say, you're a captain, we know you've not played, but, you know, here's another year at, uh, in January. Do you know what I mean? So I knew I had 18 yeah. months. And I remember my agent calling me going, look, they're not sure. And that killed me. It it was like, Phew. like I don't know if I'm going to come back from this. No, but now I don't know where the club are. And I always thought the club had me. And, and not to say the club didn't have my back because they, they'd had to look after me, obviously. <laughs> Um, that whole time but you know that was tough that was, that was quite tough for me I know the other lads also got told I, I think in around the same time like your feds and pierces they didn't know what was kind of going on where the club was going etc but I think for me it was just offer me anything <laughs> do you know what I mean just kind of like just show me you want me sort of thing yeah like show me you want me and I remember I did an interview after the derby game it was like you know I remember saying it like I just want to feel wanted kind of thing like show me that you want me I've come back I've played a few games you know I've scored um we've just beaten Derby 3-0 who were going for like the playoffs and I I think I'd won a penalty I you know played in behind was it crazy was it crazy up here was that uh, is it? yeah Q, yeah Q, yeah it was on over yeah. Palace I yeah, that's the one. I'd even played Reading first time <laughs> I've heard that name in months yeah um so I played off him that day, which was a new experience. I was kind of like hunting around the defence. And I remember just giving everything I had that day. And I was like, you know what, if it is the last day, you know, we've gone out. And it was just, I remember I gave Pierce a big hug after the game. And I was like, you know what, mate, if that's it, at least we can go out with a with a win. 
Um, so I remember saying to Charles, you know, I just want to be show, just want to be showed that I'm wanted. And I remember I, I, I had a couple of things and fans had, had tweeted me and stuff saying, what do you mean? Like show you want it. We've looked after you for 18 months. Like, show us you want to be here and it, it just wasn't that I, I kind of wanted to say a lot more than I could or I didn't know what was going to happen and it was it was just a tough horrible situation to be in so even after the season had finished we were still left there thinking what is going on so you know it, it, it was horrible like it, that whole not knowing what's happening but also I knew that I was fit as well so I knew that I kind of showed the club in these last seven games that I can get through 90 minutes and I'm fine and I'm hoping that I can get back towards where I'd like to be. But So was there was there an offer on the table from Reading that, that you, a sort of competitive offer or was it, because I remember the club putting out something, or I can't remember if it's a club or Charles, do apologise, saying that I think they'd made offers to you, Feds and Piercy to actually keep you. Was there actually something on the table or did it just sort of come too little too late for you and, and the Galatasaray offer was there? Uh, so as as the season finished, um, still hadn't... I knew they would plan in talks or anything, but nothing for me to kind of... There was nothing concrete. There, was, there wasn't there was a case of, right, Jane Redding offered this and this and, and what do you want to do? I, I was still uh, waiting by the phone and I think I'd been away on holiday... And I'd come back, and as my dad's a massive Galatasaray fan, isn't he? So um, I'd, I'd booked in tickets to go and watch the game. As that happened, I'd found out that there was interest from them. So when I flew out there, they would looked after me. <laughs> um, and I'd had a chat just to say that, you know, they were like, well, we're interested in you. And I was like, wow, like, where's that mm. come from? So then... I'd listen to them and, and stuff and they were like, right, we'll be in touch. So then I was flying back home and then my agent said, right, read in above with this. And I was like, oh, like, <laughs> like, right. Now you're I've, torn. Yeah. Now right, I've got an offer and obviously I can't go into details and that, but it wasn't, it, it felt to me, it was like a, uh, it didn't feel like. a to Was it a, to you felt kind of like a, a token? Yeah. We have yeah. to put something out to sort of way. Yeah, maybe I don't know whether, like, to, you know, you're our captain, you've been here this long, we don't want to release an academy lad or, or anything like that. It, it, that's what it felt like. It felt like, oh, we're given this, uh, he'll say no, then maybe we don't have to deal with that. Do you know what I mean? It was yeah. like putting it on me. And I was like, well, I don't want to leave. I, I remember sitting, I, I don't want to leave Reading. Like, I, it, it was never in my thoughts. But once I'd listened, once I obviously knew that had happened and then, then obviously an offer came from Galatasaray and it was like, right, they're offering you a three-year deal here. I was like, oh my God, like, and I remember speaking to my family, like, well, you've not got, you haven't got an option, Jim. Like, you haven't, like, that. that's not, this is your only option. Like, you, you love the club, like, you love Reading, but this is your dream club. Like, you, you, this is your dad's club. This is one of the biggest clubs in Europe. This is Champions League. This is everything you wanted since you were a kid and nothing, you'd never thought that. So I was like, you're right. Like, and in that, in the meantime, Reading had, had offered me something again, I guess where we'd said, right, you know, this is what the situation is. They came back again and again. And it, then I ended up getting offered for Reading with something like, why didn't you just give me that at the start? <laughs> I would never have had You would have signed down. it in January, happily. happily. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I would have. And it, and it annoyed me massively that... I remember saying, like, why didn't you just give me that then? And I would just be looking forward to going on holiday and, and coming back to, to the Red Inn. And, but it was just, you know, just being in that situation and being out for so long. And, and, and yeah, you play seven games, but you don't know where your knee's at until you play, you know, 25, 30, 45 games. You, know, you don't know, you know, how well it's going to be, especially after I told them it could be the end for me. So it was like, right, three years, over a year, you've got to take the three years. And I, and it was that was the decision really, and yeah, that that's what I went with, and, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's one I look back at still now, thinking, mm, <laughs> was I given a chance here? Mm, no, I, I'd say no, you know, and and, and I guess the writing's on, on the wall for me here, but um, you know, I've, it's just frustrating, you know. Like I, I don't get wrong, I don't think I'm the world's best player, nowhere near it, but I know I can. 
help teams. And, you know, when I'm watching, you know, them play last season, you know, they weren't doing great. And then I came in, I started a game, we'd won 4 0. We then had Benfica in the week and I was on the bench. So I was like, here we go. Now you're talking. I was like, this is the dream. And then we had a game at the weekend. I wasn't in the squad. And I was like, how can I go from, do you know what I mean? Like going from a win, win 4 0, where the team hadn't won for a little while, to not being in the squad. And that was like, right, what's going on here? Do you know what I mean? So it was like, it's been tough. And then after that, the, the manager left and then I, I went on loan. And, you know, like I say, the writing's probably on the wall for me here. But it's, uh, it's just been really frustrating the whole, the whole of it. I, I miss England massively, and I, I miss the champion. I was yeah. going to say, what 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 is a day like? Obviously, you've got family uh, and a Turkish background. What's it been like yeah. culturally living in Istanbul? I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of stuff going on politically. You've had coups, yeah. all sorts. I mean, how how is daily life for you at the moment, especially without football in it regularly? Yeah, well, like I said, at the moment, I'm I'm kind of, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say I'm kind of cast aside at the moment. I'm, I'm pretty much doing marathon training every day. <laughs> I'm, uh, I've been running to the ground uh, every day for the last, well, since the transfer window shut, which is another mental barrier itself. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep positives. Um, you know, it's been extremely hard, I guess, the living side of things. Obviously, me and my, my fiancé moved out here last, last year, you know, thinking – Wow, this will be amazing, and do you know what I mean? Like, mm. really got into it thinking, Bright wow, new start, new. yeah, exactly, yeah, like, wow, this is going to be unbelievable. Like, Istanbul, like, yeah, like, sun, like, I hopefully that she'll love it. And you know, when you're not playing football, and sadly, as as uh, my fiance's experience, I'm not the happiest guy to be around. So you kind of, especially with all the injury, and then not playing here, and the moving, it's been extremely tough, but. Yeah, like all all the the uh, the bombs. There's been a couple of bombs since I've been here. It, it's been crazy. Like you don't get that in Reading. It, it's crazy. Like I was coming back from training one day, and they were like, "Right, there's been a bomb at the Sultan Ahmed, which is you know only about 20 minutes from where where I lived at the time." And you're like, "What? Like, wh- what do you mean? Like, are we safe here? There's a lot of worry from my family, friends. You know what is going on? Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like a whole different element of." Of wow, what is happening here? And and then it was quite um, it was quite scary. My, my girlfriend and her family had come to visit, um, and the de- where there was a bomb the, the day before, she was in that exact spot. And then that kind of put it into perspective for me. I was thinking, right, this is this the is this where we should be? And I, I know a lot of people go through another lot, a lot of footballers here probably go through the same thing. But you know, it was scary, and and it's. Uh, yeah, it's been it's been worrying with the coup. Like, luckily enough, I was I was in England at the time, so uh, fortunately enough, I, I I didn't see that. But you know, if I don't know what would it would have been like you know, to be here, it's it's been crazy. It's been it's been a real whirlwind, and uh, like I say, I, I miss home incredib- incredibly much. Um, you know, I don't, like I say, I miss the championship. Then I miss playing football. You know what I mean? Massively. So. So how are, I mean the, the the thing that that amazed me, I like often no, no offense given here but the thing that one yeah. of the things that stands out about you is that you're only 27 i mean you've been yeah. like you say you, you made your debut so young for reading you can sort of forgive in my head i, I was thinking oh, how old's gem now he must be about yeah. must be about 30 odd now <laughs> you're not you, you, you're sort of this is your prime you've talked yeah. about all of those injuries you had and, and all of the on and off the field stuff that you've had in turkey how do you feel fo- footballing wise and fitness wise are, could you still? Are you still the Jem Karachan that we saw in that Watford game? Can you still go out and give that sort of performance, or have um, you maybe lost a percent or two because of everything that's happened? I, I, I haven't played. I think my last game was, um, you know, I, I finished the season obviously on loan at Bursa Sport, and um, you know, I really enjoyed it there. I, I was back playing football, obviously, like not getting much of a chance at, here, and. You know, I'd, I'd finish the season and I played right back against one of the teams I think were third at the time. You know, I had a great game. I felt brilliant. I felt it was like one of the first times I felt since all of the past and everything I'd gone through, it, I felt good. And I come off that pitch, I was like, I'm, I feel amazing. But it was the last game of the season. <laughs> so I was like, right, this is annoying. But, you know, let's see what happens. And and uh, Bursa Sport obviously came in for me in that summer. But I probably had my heart on coming home. But then again, I, I had two years left on my contract with with, uh, with Gala, you know, uh, on good money. 
so I, it's, I was in an awkward situation, you know, like I say, I was still thinking about my career, my future with, you know, my family and, and, and everything as well. But I'm desperate to play football. So I came back in the summer hoping that I'd be given a shot here and sadly I haven't been. So I'm hoping that maybe things will get sorted out in January um, and that I can come back and uh, and prove to, to someone that, um, you know, I, I'll do everything I can for whoever, whichever shirt I've got on. And, you know, I miss, like I say, I miss football so much. It's um, people say to me, "Oh, we'll come back then," and you know, it's never that easy. It's uh, it's um, it's tough. Football's tough, and um, you know, when you haven't played played for, for quite a while, you know, you can you can imagine it. it's uh, it's it's an awkward situation to be in. And I've got eighteen months left on my contract as well, so I'm, I'm pretty much in a similar situation. Weirdly, thinking about my career, my future again, rather than football, which is. Uh, which is really annoying, and I hate. I hate that. That's how it is. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, I mean, it, I'm. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna pimp you out, and I'm not gonna create <laughs> some, create some headlines for you. But yeah. if, if if the situation came up where Galatasaray said, "Jem, you can go," and a championship club by the name of Reading came in yeah. for you, and the terms were right, would you have any hesitation about going back? Because you have seen other players that you've played with, you know, come back, and it's Brian McDermott himself came back. Uh, yeah, and it's, yeah. would you have any hesitation about coming back to a club like Reading <laughs> that you played before? Well, it is annoying because when Brian came in, I went to watch. Uh, I went to watch a Reading game. Uh, we had a few days off, and I went to watch Reading. I don't know if it was his first game at home. No, no, not his first game. He won the first game. I think it was his second game, and you lost one nil. I don't know if it was it Cholton, maybe. Could be. <laughs> I blocked out most of last yeah. season. <laughs> and I went down to see him after, and, uh, and I walked in, and I saw um, I saw Brian, I saw Nicky Hammond, I saw uh, Pat Dolan was there, and it was like I walked in back home. It was like I'd walk back into my front living room, and like, everything was that was. And Brian was like, "Fancy coming back?" <laughs> <laughs> and I was there like, "Oh, you guys, you know what I want to say." Um, <laughs> but at the time, I was obviously still. Hoping, yeah. I was still involved with um, you know with Gallo at the time, and, and still involved in squads. So it was um, you know uh, if only Brian was there now. You know it, it's just timing, isn't it? Football, yeah. a lot of it comes to timing and stuff, and and who knows what will happen. But of course, if you know it, it's like if someone called you up and said you want to come home, and you've been like, do you know what I mean? It's that's what it is to me, and that's what the club is. And there's been interest from from other clubs, but like I say, it's. It's tough. I've got eight months, you know, here and on a good contract, one that made me come here in the first place. So, you know, you you have to put everything in perspective, and, and it's tough. But yeah, I, I want to come back to England. Of course, I do, and, and and just do what I love doing, which I've missed for the last three years. Mm. Um, but but once again, it's it's great to see Reading how they're doing at the moment. Obviously, unfortunate result at the weekend, but. No, I watch all the stuff that's going on there and, and I still speak to people at the club and, you know, look at your Twitters and everyone just to see what's going on, really, because, you know, I grew up there, I grew up in Reading and, you know, it's it's my home from home. So I obviously still have my family home near Reading as well. So, so, if, it's, uh, so if, the, if, the, if everything and all the stars align, you wouldn't you wouldn't worry about a second second time around or would you just want to keep that sort of legacy that you've built no, intact? I, I don't. Well, I know. Obviously, I did well for Reading. I like to think I did well. I like to think people that did well. But you know, there were I could have done better. Yeah, you know I mean, I any club that I go to next, I want to give everything I've got for them, whether it be whoever it is. Do you know what I mean? And, and whatever club it is, absolutely. I want to. I want to give everything I've got. And you know, like I say, if, if if there was a chance to come back to Reading, I'd be a fool to say no. Like in my situation, I'd be. And to kind of think about my legacy, I haven't got a legacy there. You know, you, you Sid Wells and and the other players have got legacies there, and not, not myself. You know, I've got a lot to prove to myself and a lot to prove to the fans and and everyone uh, and my family. You know, I've got I've got a lot to prove to myself. Like, there's so many people that I want to just show you, like you should have taken me, you should have given me a chance. Do you know what I mean? That kind of that thing. So well, at, yeah, at 27, there should be lots of miles left in the tank. Uh, I I like to think of myself as a young person. I was on 30. And you're still three years younger than me. Um, so a few quick fire questions before we go, because yeah. it's, it's been brilliant talking to you for the last couple of hours. Um, yeah. The first thing is, who who was your biggest mate at, at Reading oh, in your overall time there? 
Most people that were listening to this will immediately shout out Sean Morrison at, <laughs> at the yeah. uh, computer or however they're listening to this. Is it Morrow? Yeah, I'd say well, I speak to Morrow every day. I know he's on his Christmas tour at the moment dressed as, I think, Princess Fiona. So. Excellent. He's, yeah, he's um no, nah, he's he's family to me, Morrow, and he'll he'll um yeah, I love his pieces, and he's going on to do brilliant things. I think he's got a big move coming, but there, there's so many. I love Piercy to bits. I still speak to Piercy all the time, and do you know what I mean? I, I made some great friends there, even people that weren't you know players playing football, people that worked at the club, and yeah, but yeah, I'd say Morrow wins it just ahead of a couple. Yeah, where did where did Flames come from, and how did this catch on? Uh, Flames was my best mate, Callum. Uh, he's at Leighton Orient at the moment. He uh, he just came back one day and was going, oh, that's Flames, that's Flames. And it was our little group who we lived with, Morrow. I think Michael and Tony was with me at the time. We just turned into it. And then I got a dog. We were like, well, why well, won't we call it Flames? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's how it turned into it turned into that. Um, yeah, that's, that's how that happened. Best. Uh, who was the best Reading player you played with in terms of you could take one player to play with again? Who would you take? Who would I take? Uh, I love playing McGilf. You know, he, he was he was great to play with. Um, you know, a top quality player, and, and I'm sure he'll, even though he's he's done great and had a great career, I, I think he's still got a couple of big moves left in him. Uh, but there's so many. It'd be hard. I love playing with Ledge. Like the, when Ledge had to had to retire, that killed me because I knew what he'd gone through to, you know, his injuries and stuff. What he'd done for everyone, and to see him leave was was tough. But he was like uh, my best probably midfield partner. I'd say. Who was the toughest opponent you faced? Either with Reading or, or Galatasaray or another loan club? Um, at Galatasaray, I'd probably have to be saying, just before going out for a kick around against Atletico Madrid to main Mark Griezmann was probably... Ouch. Uh, yeah, was uh, was tough. Um, he was unbelievable. And Koke, I think he played, he was unbelievable. I got his shirt, which was, which was going up on my wall. But playing for Reading, yeah, all your Steve G's, your Lampards, they were, they were brilliant. But Peter Whittingham, if you were to look really? at Chich, championship players, he would always annoy me. Like he, he, he proper annoyed me playing him because he just was one of them players you just annoying. And Michael Brown, he's a, he's a <laughs> and he's a yeah, yeah. He's a, I don't think he's going to be on the uh, Christmas card list of many Reading fans uh, or Mister Warnock either. His his manager yeah. at the time. Um, I think they're safe. He, he's he's back. He's he's Morrow's manager now, isn't he? Yes, he is. But, I'll have uh, to get yeah. <laughs> yeah there you go yeah i'll have to ask him did you uh, did you send michael brown out to do my mate yeah, yeah um <laughs> been an interesting one um in your time around as well you've had you've had three owners as well yeah. you've had sir john uh anton and then you were there with the ties for the question that, especially because reading are under takeover speculation now there's there's talk of a chinese consortium possibly coming in how as players how much do you, how much do you know, and when do you know about it? Because I've spoken to other players, and they're like, "Well, we found out from reading your site or or talking to Charles." How much did you know about like Anton when stuff was going wrong? Uh, no, we didn't really. We didn't really have much. Not that I remember, we had much thing. I think Charles has got his ear pretty close to the ground. I think it just before, was it just before Charles was Johnny Fordham. So we kind of probably yeah. got everything from him. Perspective owners coming in around the tyres. There'd been a lot of murmurings about it, and obviously we knew that Anton had not been seen for a while um so we we knew and there was like random stuff going on at the training ground and people turning up and you know it, we knew something was going on but uh no it, sir john he, he's one in a million and, and i saw him when i when i came back recently and you know uh, he got on really well with him and and it was a uh, it's a shame he hasn't got as much influence now because he, yeah. he, he absolutely loves the club and he you know i hope i hope they do keep the stadium you know with his name on it because uh, he, he's made it what it is to be fair do you think just touching on Anton a bit there, there was a lot of talk as well amongst fans and they're still about the way financially how the club changed did it did that change the dynamic in the dressing room because you did have big people coming in on big money your pogs your drenters and you still had sort of local well localish lads English lads and maybe on not so much money do you think did that play an effect did, did, does that sort of thing get cause yeah. resentment in dressing rooms no, you know, I don't think it did because we still had quite a lot of the core in that team. Um, I think I think what was annoying was the fact, like I said before, is that we didn't, you know, we've got promoted. We, we've we earned Anton, I guess, a lot of money. You know, he obviously invested in the club, but we got him. We got the club promoted. We were in the Premier League. We wanted him to give it a go. And 
I guess we didn't see, like I said, we didn't really see that. We wanted to go out and buy a, you know, a, whatever it would be, a four or five million pound striker, someone that could just nick us a few goals, whatever, however much it was. Um, and maybe just players with Premier League experience. You were seeing players sign for other teams that had Premier League experience or on free transfers. We were like, we could have had him. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So that was probably more the frustrating. Like, Pog was a great lad around the place. Um, Danny Guffrey, you know, getting really well. Dan still stay in touch with Danny. And, they, you know, it was just a frustration for us that we didn't, um, you know, we didn't go for it. And so I the, think money, that's where, the money wasn't really a factor. It wasn't a case of, oh, God, why, why is he earning two, three times as much as me? Because we knew they, like, for, for us, we all, we, all got, we all earned money for going to the Premier League. Like, don't get me wrong, we all, you know, had bonuses and what, what have you. Do you know what I mean? So we all done well off that. We couldn't sit around and go, why is he earning this? It wasn't, do you know what I mean? He, he'd scored 10 goals. He was a Russian international. Of course, he's going to come in on more money for us. We were just happy that we were in the Premier League. So, yeah, it, it wasn't anything, really, for me. I never really thought about it. I just wanted to, you know, give everything we've got. But like I say, the one big factor, Frank, we, we probably did have a couple of conversations. was like, come on, we need to invest. Like, yeah. in January, come around. Like, yeah, you get a new manager in, but where's the new players as well? We give it a go. If you're going to go out, like go out on your, your shield, do you know what I mean? So that was what was frustrating. Your favourite Reading game and goal? Favourite Reading game? I don't know. It's so maybe Cardiff, like Cardiff, West Ham. Yeah, maybe Cardiff. West Ham was amazing. You know, didn't finish the game at the pitch. Uh, there's loads. Uh, like, what's funny is nothing. Someone asked me the other day, like, do you remember every game you played in? And if you was to say to me about a game... You know, like a certain game. Do you remember so and so? I'd, I'd kind of always remember it, which, which is weird, and and that like cracked me up because then I'd started thinking about random games, and then I remember like the Bristol game when Manny Mansett scored a couple in like yes. the last, the last Three couple, two. like yeah, and like you know random stuff. Like it was, uh, it was amazing. But no, I'd, I'd, I'd probably go for the Fulham, Fulham away, um, when I got my first Premier League goal, and and I had. I remember Joe had gone off, so I was wearing the armband at the time, and and I said to him I was going to get a goal. So my mum, my family, and and my missus were there, so that was massive for me. I think that one. I still got the pictures all over the place, so Sc- that was massive. Yeah, Sc- scoring a ninety eighth minute winner at Burnley. Yes, I was very good <laughs> at playing at the time because I didn't play in that. So I remember I'd got into trouble with him somehow, and uh, I remember Tavi got concussion. I came in and you know I scored the last minute goal, which yeah was amazing. You know, a tough place to go and to get that last minute game. And I remember I'd have a dislike for was it Ross Wallace. He gave me some verbal yeah. abuse. So to get into his face after it was a, uh, it was great. That one, some really good games to be a part of, and, and you know, some that are stick with me for quite a long time. And uh, just a, another question on one of your teammates as well. That again, there's yeah. divided opinion, and he's probably been. We've done 108 episodes of our podcast, and this guy's name yeah. probably comes up more than anyone else. How Robson Canoe. Why could he go and do what he did in that semi-final for Wales? And yet it just didn't ever really work out for him fully at Reading. Because you talk about that Fulham game and he was great that day and in that whole yeah. second half of the season. But why could he never quite put it together for Reading that, that you've seen him do in, in the odd game? I don't know. I, I've known how obviously since I was 15. Um, and I've also seen how go through a lot of the stuff that people don't see, where he'd done his crew shirt twice, you know, he, he transformed himself the way he, his body was. Yeah, you know I mean, he, he's got a lot of past how, and that's why everything that's come to him, he, he fully deserves, because I know how much one injury is to go through, let alone two. And I know he got told the same, that maybe it doesn't look too good for him. So he's the most dedicated, I'd say, professional that I've come across. Um that I probably he probably doesn't get a lot of applaud for that he's always one of the first in, always in the gym, always looking after his body. So he deserves a lot of what he's what he's got. It's a shame he didn't. I guess he'll probably tell himself that he didn't get more goals for Reading. But I'm sure if you also asked him, he'd say that he gave all he could for Reading as well, as he is quite a confident person. But he did great in the Premier Premier League. Yeah. He scored like quite a few goals, and I guess a lot of people thought he'd he'd go on from that. But you know, he'd always give you hundred percent, and and like I'm sure he's confident. He'd tell you, you know, honestly, like there's probably more to come from him. 
but yeah, uh, he's one of them players that you know he's got a lot of quality, which he does he does show for Wales. You know, he, he goes to Wales and he performs unbelievably in that goal. You know, it's great to see him. You know, I've known him since I was a kid, and it's brilliant to see him get a move to West Brom and be in the Premier League. And you know, all the best to him. And you know, I got I got nothing good words to say about him. But yes, I would have liked him to have scored a few more as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, as I said it's been absolutely brilliant talking to you for the last couple of hours, going through s- s- some brilliant highs and, and some unfortunate lows. Nice to um, go over a good time. So, no, I appreciate it for having me. Absolutely. Well, what the last question I'm going to leave you is: you know, you say you you want this, you want this chance to play football again. In, yeah. In sort of in sort of five years time, six five six years time, do you still hope to be playing? Have you got plans? If 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 it all doesn't work out, what are you can do? Do you want to stay in the game? Well, I was, uh, you know, obviously still quite tight with Joby and uh, he's 35 now. So I'm thinking, you know what, if he's still going, I've missed uh, quite a lot of football the last couple of years. I'm going to I'm gonna drag it out as long as I can. I mean, even my missus said to me the other day, goes, when you're like 31, what are we going to do? I was like, well, babe, I still have four four more years. <laughs> uh, don't get their hopes up now. Um, I did my B licence in the summer. Um, my coaching license um, with with Noel, Jamie Mackey, Simon Cox, and Darren O'Day. Um, that was an experience as well. That a lot, a lot, is that a deliberate all former uh, sort of thing? Me, Jamie, and Coxie had it planned yeah. um, from obviously when we were together. And then as I was on my way up, I tweeted it, and I think Noel then messaged me going, "I'm there too." And I was like, oh. <laughs> and right. then. And then Darren had messaged me as well saying, mate, you're on the call somewhere as well. As well. So it, it was good. So I'm, I'm hoping to pass that, I think, in January. I think, I think I'm think i coming back. I think we plan to have it at the training, at Redden's training. Ground. I'm not too sure. I need to check on that. But um, to get that passed, and then we're going to book in for the A licence um, next summer before I get married. And then I want to have my UA for, I think, next one is my pro licence after that. So I want to have them done, especially by the time I finish football. And then, and then look into you know, managing and, and, you know, carrying on and, and maybe, you know, having a little bit of, um, you know, what Eamon did for us, maybe I can, um, you know, help, help the younger generation as well. Cause you know, like I say, it, it's horrible, you know, what, what's happened and, and the story, but you know, there's a legacy and I think we owe it to him as well. All of us to, you know, to create that and maybe feed it back through, whether it will be at Reading in the future to the younger generation, who knows? But, you know, I, I kind of want to do that, you know, for myself, but, you know, for him as, as well. So I, that's something that I plan on doing too. Yeah, I can think of no better note to, to end an interview on that um, than, than, than such a great man as Eamon. Um, and Jem, thanks again for, for giving us your time. It's been f- fascinating um, talk. The time has absolutely flown by. Yeah. I'm sure people <laughs> listening, um, this is probably going to be a two-parter. Uh, it's so long. I'm sure people listening on, uh, I said I'm going to try, this will probably be going out around about Christmas. So people will be hopefully listening to this as they're making their way around. But I think we've yeah. got, I, I'm sure I speak for every single Reading fan when I say, Thank you very much for for you know, for everything you did for the club while you were there, um, on and off the pitch. Yeah, you know, you you were a player that, that a lot of people looked up to. And think and as well, I'm sure with that sort of determination that you'll you'll get the move, um, or things will work out wherever it be. And um, as long as you as long as you don't uh, come back to Reading and haunt us, you know. You know <laughs> Just don't don't do a Millsy to the East Stand or anything like that. That's that's all we ask, you know. Oh, what was he doing? <laughs> you should have seen the uh, the abuse every time he comes back. Even um, this time around when he was at a Forest, is it now? Yeah, yeah, They're just yeah. from the first minute, it was Millsy as a uh, a CEO yeah, next Tuesday. Was, uh, <laughs> I can't believe he did that. You still, I still can't get my head around it because he was skipper at the time, he wasn't was, he? Yeah. I turned around and the captain can't do that. <laughs> and I remember, I remember chatting after and it was like mental. Right? Uh, it was a shame really because he'd done so well for us. Like, it kind of, I don't know, maybe, yeah, you know, it's a shame. No one likes to go back to an old club and get booed, do they? So, no. It, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, he's, 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 he's got a legacy. Not, maybe not a positive yeah. one. But uh, yeah, so fingers crossed I said everything works out. Hopefully, you know, we might be able to okay. catch up with you in a couple of years' time and uh, we'll have yes. some, some more happy recent memories to talk about. But in the meantime... Yeah. Right, said, stay, stay safe out there and uh, and hopefully we'll see you around the Midday Ski in the future. Cheers, mate. Thanks Take a lot. Take it easy. Cheers. Yeah, bye-bye. The Tarlhurst End Podcast. Read the blog on thetarlhurstend.com.